Section 14 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 3, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anne Boulay. Margaret of Anjou, Chapter 2, Part 1. Queen Margaret, on the approach of York's army, had retired to Greenwich, with her ladies and the infant prince, where she remained in a state of agonizing suspense during the Battle of St. Albans. The news of the fatal blow the royal cause had received by the slaughter of her brave friends, and the captivity of the king her husband, plunged her into a sort of stupor of despair, in which she remained for many hours. Her chamberlain, Sir John Wenlock, whom she had advanced to great honors and loaded with benefits, took the opportunity of forsaking her and strengthening the party of her foe. He was chosen speaker of the Yorkist parliament, which King Henry had been compelled to summon. The king's wound was dangerous, and the alarm and excitement he had undergone brought on a relapse of his malady. So that, when the parliament assembled at Westminster, July 4th, he was declared incapable of attending to public business, and the Duke of York was commissioned to attend in his name. It was in this parliament, made up of her enemies, that Queen Margaret was for the first time publicly censured for her interference in affairs of state, it being there resolved, that the government, as it was managed by the Queen, the Duke of Somerset, and their friends, had been of late a great oppression and injustice to the people. The king was petitioned to appoint the Duke of York protector or defender of the realm, because of his indisposition, and sith he would not come down to them, that his commons might have knowledge of him. Henry, being then in the Duke of York's power, was not permitted to reject this petition, but it was repeated and urged upon him many times, before he would accede to it. As soon as the Duke of York got executive power of the crown into his hands, he resigned the custody of the king's person to the queen, and enjoined her to withdraw, with him and the infant prince, to Hertford Castle without fail. Margaret was not in a condition to resist this arrangement, but soon after found means to remove to the palace of Greenwich, with these helpless but precious objects of her care, and appeared entirely absorbed in the anxious duties of a wife and mother. It seemed, says one of her French biographers, by her conduct at this period, as if she deemed nothing on earth worthy of her attention, but the state of her husband's health and the education of her son, who was a child of early promise. Meantime, however, she strengthened the party of the Red Rose by holding frequent secret conferences in her retreat at Greenwich, with the surviving princes of the Lancastrian family and the half-brothers of King Henry, the young gallant Tudors, who were nearly allied in blood to herself. She had gathered round her withal a band of ardent and courageous young nobles and gentlemen, whose fathers were slain at St. Albans, and who were panting to avenge their parents' blood. Having thus prepared herself, Margaret remained no longer passive than the arrival of the eagerly anticipated moment, when the abatement of the king's indisposition warranted her in presenting him before his parliament. A great meeting of her adherents was previously convened at Greenwich, unknown to the Duke of York, in which the preliminary steps for this design were arranged, and on the 24th of February, 1456, King Henry entered the House of Lords, in the absence of the Duke of York, and the leading members of his faction, and declared, that being now, by the blessing of God, in good health, he did not think his kingdom was in any need of a protector, and requested permission to resume the reins of empire. The Parliament, being taken by surprise at the unexpected appearance of their sovereign among them, and the collected and dignified manner in which he addressed them, immediately acceded to his desire. The same day an order was sent by King Henry to the Duke of York, demanding the resignation of his office. York, Salisbury, and Warwick were fairly checkmated by this bold move of the Queen, and retired into the country. Margaret then caused the heir of the late Duke of Somerset, Henry Beaufort, to take the office of Prime Minister, and Henry bestowed the seals on his beloved friend Wayne Fleet, Bishop of Winchester. Henry's health being still in a perilous state, 
Queen Margaret took great pains to amuse him with everything that was likely to have a soothing influence, and to keep him in a tranquil frame of mind. There is, in Reimer's Federa, an order in council stating, that the presence of minstrels was a great solace to the king in his sixth state, and therefore the bailiffs and sheriffs of his counties were required to seek for beautiful boys, who possess musical powers, to be instructed in the art of minstrelsy and music, for his service in his court, and to receive good wages. Henry was also amused and comforted by receiving daily requests from his nobles, and others of his subjects, for leave to go on pilgrimages to various shrines in foreign parts, to pray for the re-establishment of his health and not unfrequently was he beguiled with hopes that his bankrupt exchequer was about to be replenished with inexhaustible funds by the discovery of the philosopher's stone by one or other of the learned alchemists who were constantly at work in the royal laboratory the regal authority was at this period exercised in his name by queen margaret and her council with great wisdom and ability Yet the impetuosity of her temper betrayed her into the great imprudence of attempting to interfere with the jurisdiction of the Londoners by sending the Dukes of Buckingham and Exeter with the royal commission into the city for the purpose of trying the parties concerned in a riot in which several persons had been slain. But the populace raised a tumult and would not permit the Dukes to hold a court. After several riots, Queen Margaret, not considering the person of the king safe in London, removed him to Sheen, where she left him under the care of his brother Jasper, while she visited Chester, and other towns in the Midland counties, to ascertain how the country gentry stood affected to the cause of the crown. Having every reason to confide in the loyal feelings of that portion of their subjects, Margaret decided on bringing the king in royal progress through the Midland counties, and keeping court for a time at Coventry. Nothing could exceed the enthusiastic welcome with which the king, queen, and infant prince of Wales were received by the wealthy burgesses of that ancient city. On their arrival, Margaret was complimented with a variety of pageants, in which patriarchs, evangelists, and saints obligingly united with pagan heroes of classic lore in offering their congratulations to her on having borne an heir to England, and they all finished by tendering their friendly aid against all adversaries. There are curious original portraits of Henry the Sixth and Margaret of Anjou, wrought in tapestry, still preserved in St. Mary's Hall at Coventry, probably the work of a contemporary artist in that species of manufacture, which, we need scarcely remind our readers, is not very favorable for the delineation of female beauty, but highly valuable as affording a faithful copy of the costume and general characteristics of the personages represented. Margaret appears engaged in prayer. Her figure is full length. Her hands rest on an open missal, which is before her, on a table covered with blue cloth. Her headdress is a hood richly bordered with pear pearls, which hang around her face. On the summit of the hood is a crown of fleur-de-lis, which bends to the shape of the hood at the back of the head. Behind the hood hangs a veil, figured and fringed with drops shaped like pears. On the temples, and in front of the hood, are three oval-shaped gems of great size. The queen wears a rich collar necklace, made up of round pearls and pendant pear pearls. A chain is suspended round her neck. Her dress appears brocaded. It is of a yellow color, cut square round the bust. The sleeves are straight on the shoulders, but gradually widen into great fullness, which turns up with ermine. This style is called the Rebrost sleeve, and nearly resembles the modes of Anne of Bretagne, Queen of Charles the Eighth of France, who was almost a contemporary of Margaret. With the exception of the crown, so oddly placed on the top of the hood, the whole costume is similar to the dress of that queen. The maternal tenderness of the queen, and the courageous manner in which she had upheld the rights of her royal husband, and devoted herself to the care of his health, her brilliant talents, her eloquence and majestic beauty, were at that time calculated to produce a powerful effect, on the minds of all whose hearts the rancor of party had not steeled against her influence. The favorable impression made by Margaret in that district was never forgotten, 
and Coventry, where she held her court, was ever after so devoted to her service that it went by the name of Queen Margaret's safe harbor. York, Salisbury, and Warwick were summoned to attend the council at Coventry, but these lords, mistrusting the queen in Somerset, retired to three remote stations. York to his demesnes on the marches, where he had the state and power of a sovereign, Salisbury to his castle at Middleham in Yorkshire, and Warwick to his government of Calais, of which he, unfortunately for the cause of Lancaster, retained possession. The French and Scotch availed themselves of the internal troubles of the realm to attack England this year, on which the Yorkists took advantage of the aggression of her countrymen to work upon the strong national prejudices which were more powerfully felt at that era, perhaps, than at any other period, to excite the ill will of the people against the queen, as if Margaret could have preferred the interests of her aunt's husband to her own, and that of the father of the child whom she loved with such proud and passionate fondness. So alarming, indeed, did the conduct of France appear to Margaret at this crisis, that she was the first to suggest the expediency of a reconciliation between the court and the adverse party of York and Warwick, that the whole strength of the realm might be employed against the foreign invaders. York and Warwick, by whom Margaret was equally hated and mistrusted, paid little attention to her pacific overtures. But when King Henry, in the simplicity and sincerity of his heart, wrote with his own hand a pathetic representation of the evils resulting from this protracted strife, and protested, upon the word of a Christian and a king, that no vengeance should be inflicted on any individual for past offenses against the crown. They felt it was impossible to doubt the honor and honesty of his intentions. A general congress or pacification between the belligerent lords was then resolved upon. To the Lord Mayor of London, Sir Godfrey Boleyn, was assigned the arduous office of guardian of the public tranquillity on this extraordinary occasion. And for this purpose, 10,000 of the citizens were armed, and patrolled the streets day and night, as a national guard, to prevent the plunder and bloodshed that were only too likely to arise from quarrels between the followers of the hostile peers. On the 15th of January, 1458, the Earl of Salisbury, with five hundred men, arrived, and took up his quarters at his own mansion at Cold Harbor. The Duke of York, with four hundred, lodged at Baynard's Castle. The Earl of Warwick arrived from Calais in February, with a pompous retinue of six hundred men in scarlet coats. The Dukes of Somerset and Exeter, with eight hundred followers, lodged without Temple Bar, in and about Holborn, and other places in the suburbs. The Earl of Northumberland and his kinsman, Lord Egremont, maintained the feudal state of the Percys by bringing 1,500 followers, being more numerously attended than any of the other adherents of the Red Rose. How such a congress ever came to anything in the shape of an amicable treaty must remain among the most marvelous of historic records. Two whole months were spent in fierce debates and angry recriminations, before the mediations of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the other prelates, produced the desired effect. The king and queen were easily satisfied, for they required nothing more than a renewal of homage, in which the names of Queen Margaret and her son Edward, Prince of Wales, were to be included. But the lords demanded pecuniary compensation of each other, for the damage they had sustained, not only in the plundering of their respective castles and estates, but for the loss of kinsmen. The king and queen, who had not considered it prudent to trust their persons before, among the armed negotiators of the peace, made a public entry into London, and took up their abode, March 27th, in the bishop's palace, which was a central position. The feast of the Annunciation was appointed as a day of public thanksgiving for this pacification, when the king and queen, wearing their crowns and royal robes, attended by all the peers and prelates, walked in solemn procession to St. Paul's Cathedral, and, in token of the sincerity of their reconciliation, the leading members of the lately averse factions walked hand in hand together, being paired according to the degree of deadly animosity that had previously divided them. 
The Duke of Somerset, coupled with the Earl of Salisbury, his ancient foe, headed the procession, followed by the Duke of Exeter and the Earl of Warwick, in unwanted fellowship. Then, behind the king, who walked alone, came the Duke of York, leading Queen Margaret by the hand, apparently on the most loving terms with each other. The delight of the citizens of London at this auspicious pageant manifested itself, not only in acclamations, bonfires, and other signs and tokens of popular rejoicings, but called for some of the halting lyrical effusions of their bards in commemoration. No sooner was that dissimulated love day, as Fabian calls it, over, than York withdrew to the marches, Salisbury to Yorkshire, and Warwick to his government of Calais. He was at that time Lord Admiral by patent, and thus the whole naval force of England was at the Duke of York's command, undoubtedly a great oversight on the part of the Queen. The animosity between the Queen and Warwick was not of a political nature alone, but, having been founded on a personal pique, was marked by all the bitter and vindictive feelings of private hatred. It was possible for Margaret to assume an appearance of regard for York, but she never could mask her antipathy to Warwick. It was, in all probability, from him that the scandalous imputations on her honor had first emanated, an injury no woman can be expected to forgive, much less a queen. Warwick complained of the rigor with which the queen caused an inquiry to be pushed against him, for a recent act of piracy he had committed, by plundering the Lubeck fleet on the high seas. He accused her of insincerity in the recent act of reconciliation, and of having little regard for the glory of the English arms. These expressions, being repeated in the city, caused a seditious tumult against the queen, in which her attorney general was killed. The governors of Furnival's, and Clifford's, and Baynard's inns, with Taylor, the alderman of the ward in which the fray took place, were committed to prison. This was followed by a personal attack on Warwick by the royal servants, as he was returning from the council at Westminster Palace. Warwick construed this riot into a premeditated plot devised by the queen for his destruction. Margaret retaliated the charge by accusing him of causing a tumult at the palace, and, according to Fabian, she actually procured an order in council for him to be arrested and committed to the tower. This fracas, whether originating in design or accident, occurred in a fatal hour for the queen, by affording a plausible excuse to the great triumvirs of the adverse party, York, Salisbury, and Warwick, for drawing the sword once more against the house of Lancaster, which was never again sheathed, till it had drunk the lifeblood of those nearest and dearest to Margaret, her husband, and her son. King Henry, leaving his queen to struggle with these difficulties, retired to pass that Easter at the Abbey of St. Albans. At his departure, having naught else to bestow, he ordered his best robe to be given to the prior. His treasurer heard the command with consternation, well knowing the poverty of the royal wardrobe was such, that Henry had no other garment suitable for state occasions, nor the means of providing one at his need. So, stepping up to the prior, he offered to redeem the robe for fifty marks. Henry unwillingly complied with this prudent arrangement, but he charged the prior to follow him to London for the money, which he made the reluctant treasurer disperse in his presence. The following June, 1459, the court departed from the metropolis. Queen Margaret took the king in progress through the counties of Warwick, Stafford, and Cheshire, under the pretense of benefiting his health by change of air and sylvan sports. She was accompanied by her son, the young Prince of Wales, then in his sixth year, a child of singular beauty and promise, for whom she engaged the favor of all the nobles and gentlemen in those loyal counties by causing him to distribute little silver swans as his badge wherever he came, and to all who pressed to look upon him. Margaret displayed peculiar tact in adopting for her boy the well-remembered device which had distinguished his renowned ancestor, Edward the Third, whose name he bore. So well were her impassioned pleadings in his behalf, seconded by the loveliness and winning behavior of the princely child, that ten thousand men wore his livery at the Battle of Bloor Heath. Queen Margaret witnessed this fierce conflict from the tower of Muckleston Church, a small village, 
seated on a rising ground in Staffordshire. King Henry was then at Coles Hill in Warwickshire, and Margaret, fearing for his safety, sent Lord Audley to intercept the Earl of Salisbury, then on his march from Middleham Castle, with a reinforcement of four or five thousand Yorkists. Margaret sternly bade Audley bring Salisbury before her, dead or alive. Audley posted himself on Bloor Heath, at the head of ten thousand Cheshiremen, distinguished by the red rosette of Lancaster, and their leaders by the silver swans worn on their breasts, in honor of Edward, Prince of Wales. Nearly three thousand of the flower of Cheshire, cavaliers and yeomen, perished with Audley, their leader. When Margaret, from Muckleston Tower, beheld the fall of Audley's banner, she fled to Eccles Hall Castle. King Henry, who was dangerously ill at Coles Hill, lay stretched on a pallet during the Battle of Bloor Heath, and the only token of consciousness he gave was that, when his people were removing him, he asked in a feeble voice, Who had got the day? Salisbury, through this victory, was enabled to form a junction with the Duke of York's army, and it was expected that the Duke, who now boldly asserted his title to the crown, would speedily attain the object to which all his actions, for the last twelve years, had tended. The energies of Queen Margaret's mind increased, with the perils and difficulties with which the cause of her royal husband was beset. She had, for the first time in her life, looked upon a battle, and though it was the disastrous defeat of Bloor Heath, far from being dismayed, or regarding it as the death blow to the hopes of Lancaster, it appears to have had the effect of rousing a dormant faculty within her soul, the courage and enterprise of a military leader. Hitherto she had fought her enemies from the cabinet. Now she had caught the fierce excitement of her combative nobles, and kindled with the desire of asserting the rights of her husband and her son in battlefields. It must be remembered that this martial fever was one of the epidemics of the times in which Margaret of Anjou lived, that the warlike blood of Charlemagne was thrilling in her veins, and, moreover, that she was the countrywoman and was born the contemporary of Joan of Arc, who had proved herself a more successful general against the English than all the princes and chivalry of France. Having fallen back to Coventry, she there made a general rally of the friends of Lancaster, and succeeded in getting together an efficient army once more, and before the end of October, finding the king sufficiently recovered to take the field in person, she prevailed with him to march to Ludlow, where the Duke of York and his adherents were assembled in warlike array. So greatly had the popularity of King Henry increased, in consequence of his appearance in the provinces, that the Duke of York, to his astonishment and confusion, found his own vassals so little disposed to fight against the anointed sovereign, that he thought proper to circulate a report of the king's death, and caused a solemn mass for the repose of his soul to be sung in his camp at Ludford, supposing that he might by this ruse deprive his adversaries of the sacred shield of Henry's name but the sturdy marchers showed not a whit more inclination to attack the queen, or impugn the title of the infant son of Henry, than they had done to draw the sword against himself. Margaret, having good information of what was passing in the enemy's camp, caused a pardon to be proclaimed in the king's name to all who would return to their allegiance. This was, in the first instance, treated with contempt by the Yorkist leaders, who replied, they knew better than to rely on such a staff of reed, or buckler of glass, as the promises of the king under his present guidance. Urged by his energetic consort, Henry then advanced within a mile of Ludlow Castle. The Duke of York, relying on Henry's conscientious antipathy to fighting, endeavored to play over the same game he had, under similar circumstances, done at Burnt Heath, by addressing a letter to him, full of protestations of his loyal and good intentions, and praying his sovereign to redress the grievances of the people, by eschewing his evil counsellors. But Henry, while under the immediate influence of Margaret's master mind, showed he was not now to be trifled with, and therefore answered the letter of the insurgents, by marching up to the gates of Ludlow, where the royal pardon was again proclaimed. This being followed by the submission or desertion of many of the Yorkist soldiers, the Duke and his second son, Edmund, Earl of Rutland, fled to Ireland, and the Earls of Salisbury and Warwick, with the heir of York, 
Edward, Earl of March, sailed for Calais, leaving the Duchess of York to defend the castle as she could. She and her two youngest sons were made prisoners by the king, who sacked and plundered the town and castle of Ludlow to the bare walls. Such was the result of the first campaign that was shared by the queen, and if we are to credit the assertions of all historians, directed by her councils. This signal victory having been happily achieved without bloodshed, Margaret returned in triumph with her royal spouse to her trusty friends at Coventry, where Henry commanded a parliament to meet November 20th. King Henry appears to have been more offended at the mass that was said for his soul in the camp of his enemies than at any of their less innocent acts of treason. It is mentioned with peculiar acrimony in a bill of attainer passed against York and his party by this parliament as the very climax of their villainies. For the security of Margaret and the young prince, a new and solemn oath of allegiance was framed and sworn to by the peers and prelates of this parliament, in which each liegeman, after engaging to do his true devour to King Henry, added these words. Also to the wheel, surety, and preserving of the person of the most high and benign princess Margaret, the queen, my sovereign lady, and of her most high and noble estate, she being your wife, and also to the wheel and surety and honor of the person of the right high and mighty Prince Edward, your first begotten son. The king, by the authority of the same parliament, granted to Queen Margaret the manner of caution, with the appurtenances in wilts, and twenty pounds yearly out of the ownage of cloth in London, in exchange for the manner of Havering Bower, which had been settled on her. The triumph of the royal cause was brief. Calais and the naval power of England were at the command of Margaret's determined adversary, Warwick, and from that quarter the portentous storm clouds began once more to threaten. Margaret was at this period personally engaged in courting popularity among the aristocracy of Norfolk. Dame Margaret Paston describes some of her proceedings while in Norfolk in a familiar epistle to her husband, which is too rich a specimen of the manners of the times, and the arts used by the queen to ingratiate herself individually with the ladies of Norfolk, to be omitted. Letter from Margaret Paston. As for tidings, the queen came into this town on Tuesday last, past afternoon, and abode there till it was Thursday three o'clock, and she sent after my cousin, Elizabeth Clare, by Sharonham, to come to her, and she durst not disobey her commandment, and came to her. And when she came in the queen's presence, the queen made right much of her, and desired her to have a husband, the which she shall know of hereafter. But as for that, he is never the nearer than before. The queen was right well pleased with her answer, and reported her of the best wise, and saith, by her troth, she saw no gentlewoman, since she came into Norfolk, that she liked better than she doth her. When the queen was here, I borrowed my cousin Elizabeth Clare's device, necklace, for I durst not for shame go with my beads amongst so many fresh gentlewomen, fashionably dressed ladies, as here were at that time, Friday before St. George. How vigilant and unremitting a scrutiny Margaret, by some indirect means, kept upon the conduct of the nobility and gentry at that period, and how minute and particular was the information she contrived to obtain of all their actions, and even of the proceedings of their servants, may be gathered from the following extract from a contemporary letter addressed to Sir John Paston. I beseech you to remember that I have aforetime been accused unto the king's highness and the queen's, for owing my poor good will and service unto my lord York and others, etc., whereof I suppose Sir Thomas Bingham, as remembered, that I brought him once from my lady, Duchess of Norfolk, a purse and five marks, three pounds, six shillings, eight pence, therein, and to Sir Philip Wentworth another, and a hundred shillings therein, for their good will and advice therein to my lady, and all of us that were appealed for that case. Notwithstanding, the king wrote to my lord, by the means of the Duke of Somerset, that we should be avoided from him, and within this two years we were, in likewise, labored against the queen, so that she wrote to my lord to avoid us, saying, 
that the king and she could, nor might in no ways, be assured of him and my lady, as long as we were about him, and much other things, as may be sufficiently proved by the queen's writing, under her own signet and sign manual, which I showed to the Lord Canterbury and other lords. Meantime, the band of veterans which Warwick had brought from Calais, had swelled into a puissance, whose numbers have been variously reported by historians, from 25,000 to 40,000 men. With this force he and his military elevé, Edward, Earl of March, triumphantly entered London, July 2nd, 1460, the citizens throwing open their gates for their admittance. On the ninth of the same month, they measured swords with the royal army at Northampton. So ardently devoted to her service did Queen Margaret find the chivalry, whom she had arrayed beneath the banner of the Red Rose, to defend the rights of her husband and her son, that, imagining herself secure of victory, she induced the king to quit to the town of Coventry, and, crossing the river Neen, to encamp with his army in the plain between Harsington and Sandiford. The fiery heir of York then advanced his father's banner, and attacked the host of Lancaster, at seven in the morning, with one of his tremendous charges. The battle lasted but two hours, and was decided by the treachery of Lord Grey de Ruthen, who admitted the Yorkists into the heart of the royal camp. Ten thousand tall Englishmen, says Hall, were slain or drowned in attempting to repass the river, and King Henry himself, left all lonely and disconsolate, was taken prisoner. The Dukes of Somerset and Buckingham were the leaders of the royal army. Buckingham was slain in the battle, where also fell another staunch friend of Margaret and the cause of the Red Rose, John Talbot, Earl of Shrewsbury, a son not unworthy of his renowned sire, Talbot, our good doge, as he was called in the quaint but significant parlance of his party. Somerset escaped to fulfill a darker destiny. Queen Margaret was not herself in the battle, but with her boy, the infant hope of Lancaster, was posted at a short distance from the scene of action, on a spot whence she could command a prospect of the field, and communicate with her generals. When, however, she witnessed the treachery of Lord Grey, and the headlong rush of her disordered troops, to repass the river they had crossed that morning so full of hope and ardor, the pride and courage of the heroine yielded to maternal terror and forgetful of every other consideration but preservation of her boy, she fled precipitately, with him and a few faithful followers, towards the bishopric of Durham. But Durham was no place of refuge for the queen, who had previously incurred the ill will of the citizens, by some arbitrary measure or imprudent burst of temper. William of Worcester relates, that Queen Margaret and the Prince of Wales, were actually captured, while flying from Eggis Hall to Chester, by John Cleager, one of Lord Stanley's servants, and spoiled of all her jewels. But while they were rifling her baggage, of which her attendants had charge, she seized an opportunity of escaping with the prince. On the road she was rejoined by the Duke of Somerset, and after a thousand perils, succeeded in reaching Harleach Castle, an almost impregnable fortress in North Wales, where she was honorably received, and manfully protected, by Dafin ap Jeowan ap Enion, a Welsh chieftain, who, in stature and courage, resembled one of the doughty Cambrian giants of metric romance. In this rocky fastness, which appeared as if formed by nature for the shelter of the royal fugitives, they remained safe from the vindictive pursuit of their foes, while the unfortunate king was conducted to London, by those whom the fortunes of war had rendered the arbiters of his fate. He was treated with external marks of respect by the victors, but was compelled by them to summon a parliament, for the purpose of sanctioning their proceedings, and reprobating those of his faithful friends. During the interval before it met at Westminster, and while all parties remained in uncertainty as to what had become of the Queen and the Prince of Wales, Henry was removed for a short time to Eltham, and permitted to recreate himself with hunting and field sports, in which, notwithstanding his mild and studious character, Henry the Sixth appears to have taken much pleasure. He was under the charge of the Earl of March, who kept a watch over him. The Duke of York, having received the news of the signal triumph of his party, entered London, October 10th, at the head of a retinue of five hundred horsemen, with a sword of state borne before him, 
and riding straight to Westminster, he passed through the hall into the House of Lords, advancing to the regal canopy, and laid his hand upon the throne, with a gesture and look, implying that he only waited for an invitation to take possession of it. But a dead silence prevailed, even among his own partisans, which was at length broken by the Archbishop of Canterbury asking him, if he would be pleased to visit the king, who was in the queen's suite of apartments, those belonging to the sovereign having been appropriated to the Duke of York's use. I know of no one in this realm who ought not rather to visit me, was the haughty rejoinder of the duke. With these words, he angrily left the house. The peers by whom these rival claims were to be decided had, to a man, sworn their liegemen's oaths to King Henry, and to him they referred the question, as to which had the legal claim to the crown, himself, or his cousin Richard, Duke of York. Henry, though a captive in the power of his rival, replied in these words, My father was king, his father was also king. I have worn the crown forty years, from my cradle. You have all sworn fealty to me as your sovereign, and your fathers have done the like to my father and grandfather. How then can my right be disputed? The king, notwithstanding, agreed, that if he were permitted to wear the crown during his life, the Duke of York or his heirs should succeed to the royal dignity at his decease. Henry was next compelled, by those who had the custody of his person, to give the regal sanction to the peremptory mandate, for the return of his consort and son to the metropolis, attaching no milder term than that of high treason to a willful disobedience of this injunction. Margaret was a fugitive, without an army, without allies, kindred, or money, when she received this summons, together with the intelligence, that the rights of her boy had been passively surrendered by his unfortunate sire to the hostile princes of the line of York. Tidings that would have overwhelmed any other female with despair, had the effect of rousing all the energies of her nature into the resistless determination of purpose, which for a time redeemed the cause of Lancaster from ruin. The King of Scotland was the son of a Lancastrian princess. His sister Margaret, the late Dauphiness of France, had been closely connected with Margaret of Anjou, both by marriage and friendship, and she resolved on trying the efficacy of a personal application to that monarch for assistance in this emergency. Having caused a report to be circulated that she was raising forces in France, Margaret quitted her rocky eyrie among the wilds of Snowdon, where her beauty, her courage, and the touching circumstances under which she appeared, had created among her loyal Welsh adherents an interest not unlike that which is occasionally felt for the distressed queens of tragedy and romance. The popular Welsh song, Farewell Itty Peggy Ban, is said to have been the effusion of the bards of that district on the occasion of her departure. The communication between Wales and Scotland was facilitated for Margaret by the proximity of Harlot Castle to the Menai, on which it is supposed she embarked with her son and a few trusty followers. Her negotiations at the court of Scotland were prosperous, and her measures so vigorous that in less than eight days after she had received the order, in King Henry's name, for her immediate return to London, she was at the head of an army, had crossed the Scottish border, unfurled the banner of the Red Rose, and, strengthened by all the chivalry of Northumberland, Cumberland, Lancaster, and Westmoreland, presented herself at the gates of York, before the leaders of the White Rose party were fully aware that she was in England. The Duke of York, who had by no means anticipated this prompt and bold response to the proclamation he had enforced his royal captive to send to the fugitive queen, left London with the Earl of Salisbury, at the head of such forces as could be hastily collected, to check the fierce career of the lioness, whom they had rashly roused from her slumberous stupor of despair. On Christmas Eve, the Duke reached his strong castle of Sandal, where, with five thousand men, he determined to await the arrival of his son Edward, who was raising the border forces. Before this could be effected, Queen Margaret advanced to Wakefield, and, appearing under the walls of Sandal Castle, defied the Duke to meet her in the field day after day, and used so many provoking taunts on his want of courage in suffering himself to be tamely braved by a woman, that York, 
who certainly had had little reason to form a very lofty idea of Margaret's skill as a military leader, determined to come forth and do battle with her. Sir Davy Hall, his old servant, represented to him that the queen was at the head of 18,000 men, at the lowest computation, and advised him to keep within his castle, and defend it till the arrival of his son with the border forces. The duke disdaining this prudent counsel, indignantly replied, Ah, Davy, Davy, hast thou loved me so long, and wouldst thou have me dishonored? Thou never sawest me keep fortress when I was regent in Normandy, where the dauphin himself, with his puissance, came to besiege me, but like a man, and not like a bird in a cage, I issued and fought with mine enemies, to their loss ever, I thank God, and if I have not kept myself within walls for fear of a great and strong prince, nor hid my face from any man living, wouldst thou that I, for dread of a scolding woman, whose only weapons are her tongue and her nails, could incarcerate myself and shut my gates? Then all men might of me wonder and report to my dishonor that a woman hath made me a dastard, whom no man could ever yet prove a coward. The duke concluded by declaring his intention to advance his banner in the name of God and St. George. Then with his brother-in-law, the Earl of Salisbury, he issued from his stronghold and set his battle in array, in the hope of driving his female adversary from the field. Margaret had drawn up her puissance in three bodies. The central force was commanded by Somerset under her directions, it is said. But it is by no means certain that she played the Amazon by fighting in person on this or any other occasion. The other two squadrons were ambushed to the right and left, under the orders of the Earl of Wiltshire and Lord Clifford. And as soon as York had entered the plain, and was engaged by the vanguard, they closed him in on either side, like, says Hall, a fish in a net, or a deer in a buckstall, so that in less than half an hour he, manfully fighting, was slain, and his army discomfited. Two thousand of the Yorkists lay dead on the field, and the ruthless Clifford, on his return from the pursuit, in which he had slain the young Earl of Rutland, in cold blood, on Wakefield Bridge, severed the head of the Duke of York from his lifeless body, crowned it with paper, and presented it to Queen Margaret on the point of a lance, with these words, Madam, your war is done, and here is your king's ransom. The Lancastrian peers who surrounded the queen raised a burst of acclamation, not unmixed with laughter, as they directed the attention of their royal mistress to the ghastly witness of their triumph. Margaret at first shuddered, turned pale, and averted her eyes, as if affrighted by the horrid spectacle thus unexpectedly offered to her gaze. But the instinctive emotions of woman's nature were quickly superseded by feelings of vindictive pleasure, and when she was urged to look again upon this king without a kingdom, who had endeavored to wrest the crown of England from her husband and her son, she looked and laughed, laughed long and violent, and then commanded the head of her fallen foe to be placed over the gates of York. She likewise ordered the Earl of Salisbury, who was among the prisoners, to be led to the scaffold the following day, and caused his head to be placed by that of his friend and brother-in-law, the Duke of York. In the blindness of her presumption, when issuing these orders, she bade the ministers of her vengeance, take care that room were left between the heads of York and Salisbury for those of the Earls of March and Warwick, which she intended should soon keep them company. End of section 14. Section 15 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 3, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anne Boulay. Margaret of Anjou. Chapter 2, Part 2. The demons of war were now let loose in all their destroying fury, and the leaders of the rival parties emulated each other in deeds of blood and horror. 
Edward, Earl of March, won a battle at Mortimer's Cross, February 1st, which was followed by a sanguinary execution in reprisal for his brother's murder and the outrage offered to his father's remains. Margaret, however, pushed on, with relentless impetuosity, to the metropolis, with the intention of rescuing her captive lord from the thraldom in which he had been held, ever since the Battle of Northampton. It must have been at this time she published two remarkable manifestos addressed to the English people. By the Queen, right trusty and well-beloved, we greet you heartily well. And whereas the late Duke of N., York, of extreme malice, long hid under color, imagining by many ways the destruction of my lord's good grace, Henry the Sixth, whom God of his mercy ever preserve, hath now late, upon an untrue pretense, feigned a title to my lord's crown and royal estate, contrary to his allegiance, and divers solemn oaths of his own, and fully proposed to have deposed him of his regality, nay had been but for the said unchangeable and true dispositions of you and other true liegemen for the which your worshipful dispositions we thank you as heartily as we can and how be it the said untrue unsad unsteady and unadvised person of very pure malice disposed to continue in his cruelness to the utter undoing if he might of us and of our said lord's son and ours the prince which of god's mercy he shall not have the power to perform by the help of you and all other my lord's faithful disposed subjects hath thrown among you as we be certainly informed divers untrue and feigned matters and surmises and in especial that we and my lord said son and ours should newly draw towards you with an uncivil power of strangers disposed to rob and despoil you of your goods and havers we will that ye shall know for certain that at such time as we or our said son shall be disposed to see my lord henry the sixth as our duty is ye nor none of ye shall be robbed despoiled or wronged by any person or any other sent in our name praying you in our most hearty way that in all earthly thing ye will diligently intend attend to the safety of our lord's royal person so that through the malice of his said enemy he be no more troubled vexed and jeoparded and in so doing we shall be to you such lady as of reason ye shall be largely content given under our signet margaret in this proclamation endeavoured at the same time to counteract the report that her northern allies had received from her the promise of pillaging all england south of the trent to shield the person of her lord from injury she added a second manifesto in the name of her young son much to the same purpose but meant more particularly to reassure the city of london for young edward is made to assert how improbable it was that he descended of the blood royal and inheriting the preeminence of the realm should intend the destruction of that city which is our lord's king henry's greatest treasure the address concludes with much earnest entreaties for all men to have such care of King Henry's royal person, that by the malice of our said traitor, York, he may take no hurt. While Margaret was thus providing as far as possible for the safety of her consort, Warwick, leading his royal prisoner in his train, intercepted her army at the head of his forces. The earl took possession of St. Albans, and filled the streets with archers to oppose her passage. When the queen attempted to pass through the town, she was driven back by a storm of arrows from the market-place. But, with dauntless intrepidity, she forced her way through a lane into St. Peter's Street, and drove Warwick's archers back upon the vanguard of his army, which was encamped at Barnet Heath. Here a furious conflict took place, almost hand to hand, neither party giving quarter. Warwick's army was chiefly composed of Londoners, who proved no match for the stout northern men whom Margaret kept pouring upon them. Lovelace, who commanded a large body of city bands, having a secret understanding with the queen, kept aloof till the fortunes of the day were decided in her favor. On the approach of night, the Yorkists dispersed and fled, leaving their royal prisoner, King Henry, nearly alone in a tent, 
with Lord Montague, his chamberlain, and two or three attendants. His life was in absolute peril, from the fierce northern muster arrayed by the queen, under the banner of the Red Rose, for they were unacquainted with his person, and equally athirst for plunder and for blood. The queen was not herself aware of the proximity of her captive lord to the scene of her triumph, till his faithful servant, Howe, ran to Lord Clifford's quarters, to announce the fact. Attended by Clifford, she flew to greet him, and they embraced with the most passionate tokens of joy. Margaret exultingly presented the young Prince of Wales, who had been her companion during the perils of that stormy day, to his enfranchised sire and sovereign, and requested Henry to bestow knighthood on the gallant child, and thirty more of their adherents, who had particularly distinguished themselves in the fight. The victorious queen, with the king, the prince of Wales, and the northern lords, went immediately to return thanks to God in the abbey church of St. Albans for the deliverance of the king. They were received by the abbot and monks with hymns of triumph at the church door. After this solemn office was performed, the king and queen were conducted to their apartments in the abbey, where they took up their abode. It is deeply to be regretted that the queen sullied this victory by the execution of the Lord Bonville and Sir Thomas Curiel. Some historians have said they were beheaded in the presence of herself and the young prince, her son, in defiance of King Henry's promise that their lives should be spared if they remained in the tent with him to assist in protecting him during the rout at St. Albans. Unfortunately for Margaret, the provocations she had received were of a nature calculated to irritate her no less as a woman than as a queen. The imputations which had been cast, by party insinuations, on the legitimacy of her son, had naturally kindled feelings of the bitterest indignation in her heart, and the attempt to exclude him from this succession, in favor of the hated line of York, acting upon her passionate maternal love and pride, converted all the better feelings of her nature into fierce and terrific impulses, till at length the graceful attributes of mind and manners by which the queen, the beauty and the patroness of learning, had been distinguished, were forgotten in the ferocity of the Amazon and the Avenger. The parties of the rival roses were so nicely balanced, in point of physical force, at this period, that one false step on either side was sure to prove fatal to the cause of the person by whom it might be taken. That person was Queen Margaret. Flushed with her recent triumphs, and cherishing a wrathful remembrance of the disaffection of the Londoners, she sent a haughty demand of provisions for her army to the civic authorities. The Lord Mayor was embarrassed by this requisition, for, though he was himself faithfully attached to the cause of Lancaster, his fellow citizens were greatly opposed to it. However, he exerted his authority to procure several cartloads of salt fish, bread, and such Lenten fare, for the use of the Queen's army. But the populace, encouraged by the news that the Earl of Warwick had formed a junction with the army of the victorious heir of York, and that they were in full march to the metropolis, stopped the carts at Cripplegate. Margaret was so greatly exasperated when she learned this, that she gave permission to her fierce northern auxiliaries to plunder the country up to the very gates of London. The Lord Mayor and Recorder, greatly alarmed, sought, and through the influence of the Duchess of Bedford, Lady Scales, and Elizabeth Woodville, succeeded in obtaining an audience with the Queen at Barnet, for the purpose of dissuading her from her impolitic revenge. Margaret would only agree to stop the ravages of her troops, on condition of being admitted with her army into the city. The Lord Mayor represented the impossibility of complying with her wish, as he was almost her only adherent in London. Before the Queen and the Lord Mayor had ended their debate, the northern troops, whom Margaret had lured across the Trent with promises of plundering the rich southern counties, had already commenced their depredations in the town of St. Albans, and King Henry broke up the conference between the Queen, her ladies, and the Lord Mayor, by imploring her assistance in preserving the beautiful Abbey of St. Albans from fire and spoil. 
the danger that threatened their lives and properties, and the disgust created by the rash and vindictive conduct of the queen, decided all London and its vicinity to raise the White Rose Banner, on the approach of the heir of York, with Warwick at the head of forty thousand men. And the firm refusal of the Londoners to admit the queen and her ill-disciplined and lawless troops within their walls, compelled Margaret, with her forces, to fall back towards the northern counties. She carried with her King Henry, and their son, the Prince of Wales. The next day, Edward entered London in triumph. He was received by the citizens as their deliverer, and on the 4th of March, he was proclaimed king, with universal acclamations, by the style and title of Edward the Fourth. It is worthy of notice that in three great political struggles, the suffrages of the city of London turned the balance. The Empress Maud, Margaret of Anjou, and Charles I lost all with the goodwill of the Londoners. The recognition of Edward IV by the Londoners, though generally considered as the death blow to the cause of Lancaster, only served to rouse the queen to greater energy of action. She was the heroine of the northern aristocracy and the Midland counties, who, though they had suffered so severely for their devotion to her cause, were still ready to rally, at her need, round the banner of the Red Rose. An army of sixty thousand men was, in the course of a few days, at her command. But her generals, Somerset and Clifford, prevailed on Margaret to remain with the king and the young Prince of Wales, at York, while they engaged the rival sovereign of England. Edward, with nearly equal forces, advanced in concert with the Earl of Warwick, to Ferry Bridge, where, on the 28th of March, Clifford and his men, early in the morning, won the bridge, and surprised the advanced guard of the Yorkists. The able generalship and hot valor of King Edward retrieved the fortunes of the fight, and when darkness parted the combatants, he remained in possession of the battlefield. The contest was renewed in the fields between Towton and Saxton, with redoubled fury, at nine the following morning, being Palm Sunday, which, says the chronicler, was celebrated that day with lances instead of palms. The heavy snowstorm, drifting full in the faces of the Lancastrian party, blinded their archers, who shot uncertainly, while those of York, with fatal effect, discharged their flight arrows, and then, advancing a few paces, shot a second shower among the chivalry of the Red Rose. The result of this dreadful battle, where the strength and flower of the Lancastrians perished, is best described in the immortal verse of Lorette Southey. Witness airs unhappy water, where the ruthless Clifford fell, and where Wharf ran red with slaughter, on the day of Towister's field, gathered in its guilty flood, the carnage and the ill-spilt blood, that forty thousand lives could yield. Cressy was to this but sport, Poitiers but a pageant vain, and the work of Agincourt, only like a tournament. Margaret fled with her consort and son to Newcastle, and from thence to Alnwick Castle. A mournful welcome awaited her there, for its gallant lord had fought and fallen in her cause at Towton. It is recorded by Leland, that during her temporary sojourn in this neighborhood, Queen Margaret, with her own hand, shot a buck, with a broad arrow, at Alnwick Park. This anecdote implies that the royal fugitives enjoyed the relaxation of sylvan sports, while partaking of the generous hospitality of the loyal and courageous House of Percy, on their disastrous retreat to the Scottish border. It is, moreover, the only proof of Margaret's personal prowess in the use of deadly weapons, and shows that she possessed strength of arm, and no inconsiderable skill in handling the long bow. She had been always accustomed to accompany the king in hunting, hawking, and other field sports, in which Henry the Sixth so much delighted, and in which he was encouraged by her, as beneficial to his peculiar constitution. From Alnwick, Margaret proceeded to Berwick, with her husband, her son, and a few faithful ladies and followers, who attended the perilous wanderings of the Lancastrian court. While there, the desperation of her husband's cause betrayed the distressed queen into the unpopular measure of surrendering Berwick to the Scotch. 
She also negotiated a treaty of marriage between the young Prince of Wales, then in his eighth year, and the Lady Margaret of Scotland, sister of the young King James the Third, having won the friendship of the Queen Regent, Mary of Geldres, and purchased the good offices of the powerful Earl of Angus, by the promise of an English dukedom. Warwick, with shrewd policy, endeavored to traverse this negotiation, by proffering to the Queen Mother of Scotland, the hand and crown of the handsome bachelor sovereign, Edward of York, for herself, in lieu of a marriage between her little daughter and the young heir of Lancaster. But Margaret's personal influence prevailed over all opposing interests, and the Prince of Wales became the betrothed spouse of the Princess of Scotland. After all these efforts of Margaret, the marriage was finally broken by the interference of Philip, Duke of Burgundy, who forbade his niece, Mary of Gildress, Queen Regent of Scotland, to ally herself with his family foe, Margaret of Anjou, a proceeding which threw Margaret into transports of rage, and caused her to utter some vain threats against the person of Duke Philip. While Margaret of Anjou, with the formidable activity of a chess queen, was attempting, from her safe refuge in Scotland, to check her adversary's game, she was, with the king her husband and her little son, proscribed and attained by the parliament of the rival sovereign of England, and it was forbidden to all their former subjects to hold any sort of communication with them on pain of death. The whole of England was now subject to the authority of Edward the Fourth. Yet there was still an undying interest pervading the great body of the people in favor of the blameless monarch to whom their oaths of allegiance had been in the first instance plighted. Poetry, that powerful pleader to the sympathies of generous natures in behalf of fallen princes, failed not to take the holy Henry for its theme. The following lines from the contemporary verses of John Audley, the blind poet, have some rugged pathos, and afford a specimen of the minstrelsy of the period. I pray you, sirs, of your gentry, sing this carol reverently, for it is made of King Henry. Great need for him we have to pray. If he fare well, well shall we be, for else we may lament full sorely. For him shall weep full many an eye, thus prophesies the blind Audley and many were the faithful hearts ready to sacrifice fortune and life at the call of the royal heroine of the Red Rose, who, at the age of thirty-two, was still in the meridian splendor of her beauty and the full power of her genius. The devoted nature of the attachment Margaret excited among the Lancastrian chiefs may be gathered from the following letter from two of her adherents, whom she had sent, with the Duke of Somerset, on a private mission to her royal kinsman and friend, Charles the Seventh, These letters, which were intended to break to the luckless queen the calamitous tidings of that monarch's death, were addressed to Margaret in Scotland, but were intercepted at sea. Madam, please your good grace, we have since your coming hither written to your highness thrice, one by the Carvel, in which we came, the other two from Dieppe. But, madam, it was all one thing in substance, putting you in knowledge of your uncle's death, Charles the Seventh, whom God assoil, and how we stood arrested and do yet. But on Tuesday next, we shall up to the king, Louis the Eleventh, your cousin German. His commissaries, at the first of our tarrying, took all our letters and writings, and bare them to the king, leaving my lord of Somerset in keeping, under arrest, at the castle of Arques, and my fellow Whittingham and me, for we had safe conduct, in the town of Dieppe, where we are yet. Madam, fear not, but be of good comfort, and beware ye venture not your person, me my lord the prince, by sea, till ye have other word from us, unless your person cannot be sure where ye are, and extreme necessity drive ye thence. And for God's sake, let the king's highness be advised of the same, for, as we are informed, the Earl of March, Edward the Fourth, is into Wales by land, and Hark sent his navy thither by sea. And, madam, think verily, as soon as we be delivered, we shall come straight to you, unless death take us by the way, which we trust he will not, till we see the king and you peaceably again in your realm, the which we beseech God soon to see, and to send you that your highness desireth. Written at Dieppe, the 30th day of August, 1461. 
your true subjects and liegemen, Hungerford and Whittingham. These faithful adherents of Margaret had, with the Duke of Somerset, been arrested in the disguise of merchants by orders of Louis the Eleventh, who, with his usual selfish policy, was willing to propitiate the victorious Edward of York. It was to exert her personal influence with Louis for their liberation, as well as to implore his succor in the cause of her unfortunate husband, that Margaret undertook her first voyage to the continent. Leaving King Henry at the court of Scotland, she, with her young son, the Prince of Wales, sailed from Kirkhudbright and landed at Bretagne, April 8, 1462. According to one of her French biographers, Margaret, being entirely destitute of money, was indebted for the means of performing this voyage to the gratitude of a French merchant, to whom, in her early days, she had rendered an important service at her father's court at Nancy. He had since amassed great wealth by establishing a commercial intercourse between the Low Countries and Scotland. He was in Scotland at the time of Margaret's sore distress, and provided her with a vessel and money for the purpose she required. The pecuniary aid supplied by private friendship is, however, seldom proportioned to the exigencies of exiled royalty, and Margaret was compelled to make an appeal to the compassion of the Duke of Bretagne, immediately after she entered his dominions. The Duke presented the royal suppliant with the seasonable donation of 12,000 crowns, with which she was enabled to administer to the necessities of some of her ruined followers, and to pursue her journey to Chinon in Normandy, where Louis XI was with his court. Somerset, Hungerford, and Whittingham had been liberated before the arrival of their royal mistress, and had engaged a carvel, or small merchant vessel, in which they sailed from the inhospitable shores of Normandy, and, unconscious that she had sailed for France, long hovered off the coast of Scotland, in expectation of being able to convey her to some Flemish port. Queen Margaret of England and Louis XI of France were the children of the tenderly attached brother and sister, René and Mary of Anjou, and they had been companions in childhood. But the ties of kindred and affection were little regarded by the cold and selfish son of Charles VII. When the distressed queen, with her disinherited son, threw herself at his feet, and with floods of tears, implored his assistance in behalf of her dethroned consort. She found him callous to her impassioned eloquence, and not only indifferent to her grief, but eager to profit by the adverse circumstances which had brought her as a suppliant to the foot of his throne. The only condition on which he would even advance a small loan of twenty thousand livres in her dire necessity was, that she should, in the name of King Henry, pledged Calais to him as a security for its repayment within twelve months. The exigency of her situation compelled Margaret to accede to these hard terms. Probably she considered, in the very spirit of a female politician, that she made little sacrifice in stipulating to surrender that which was not in her possession. The agreement into which Queen Margaret entered with Louis did not, as her enemies have represented, involve the sale of Calais, but simply amounted to a mortgage of that important place. This is the document by which the arrangement is explained. It is still preserved in the archives of France. Margaret, Queen of England, being empowered by the King of England, Henry the Sixth, her husband, acknowledges the sum of 20,000 livres, lent to her by the king Louis the Eleventh, to the restitution of which she obliges the town and citadel of Calais, promising that as soon as the king, her husband, shall recover it, he will appoint there as captain his brother Jasper, Count of Pembroke, or her cousin, Jean de Foix, Count of Candale, who will engage to surrender the said town to king Louis the Eleventh within one year as his own, or pay to the said King Louis forty thousand livres, double the debt lent, sealed at Chinon, Juin, 1462. This transaction was reported greatly to Margaret's disadvantage in England, and, like the recent surrender of Berwick, was considered by the great body of the people as an act of treason against the realm. 
Louis bestowed many deceitful marks of regard on Margaret while this negotiation was in progress, and she was complimented by being united with him in the office of sponsor to the infant son of the Duke and Duchess of Orléans, afterwards Louis the Twelfth of France, whom she presented at the baptismal font. It was fruitless for Margaret to look for succor from her own family. King René and his son were engaged in a desperate and ruinous contest with Alfonso, King of Aragon, which the resources of Anjou and Provence were overtaxed to support. Kindred and countrymen had failed her in her sore adversity, but her appeal to all true knights to aid her in her attempts to redress the wrongs of her royal spouse and vindicate the rights of her son, met with the response which proved that the days of chivalry were not ended. If we are to believe the French historians, says Guthrie, Pierre Brise, the Seneschal of Normandy, impelled by a more tender motive than that of compassion or ambition, entered as a volunteer, with two thousand men, into her service. Brise had formerly been the minister and favorite of Margaret's uncle, Charles the Seventh. He was one of the commissioners by whom the inauspicious marriage of that princess with Henry the Sixth was negotiated, and he had greatly distinguished himself at her bridal tournament. Eighteen years of care and sorrow had passed over the royal beauty, in whose honor Sir Pierre de Brise had maintained the preeminence of the daisy flower against all challengers, and in the place de Carri, and now she, who had been the star and inspiration of the poets and chevaliers of France, had returned to her native land, desolate, sorrow-stricken, and discrowned. Pierre de Brise manifested a devotion to her interests, which proved how little external circumstances had to do with the attachments excited by this princess. Margaret sailed for England in October, after an absence of five months, and eluding the vigilance of Edward's fleet, which had been long in waiting to intercept her, she made the coast of Northumberland. She attempted to land at Tynemouth, but the garrison pointed their cannon against her. According to some accounts, she resolutely effected her purpose, but had scarcely set her foot on shore, when the foreign levy, understanding that Warwick was in the field at the head of 40,000 men, fled to their ships in a panic, leaving Queen Margaret, her son, and Brise almost alone. A fisherman's boat was the only vessel that could be obtained for these illustrious fugitives, and in this frail bark they escaped the fury of the storm, which dashed the tall ships of the recreants, who had forsaken them on the rocky coast of Bamboro. Margaret and Brise were the first who carried the evil tidings of the loss of her munitions, and dearly purchased treasures to her anxious friends at Berwick. The fate of the Frenchmen, who were cut to pieces by Sir Robert Ogle when they fled to Holy Island, was probably regarded as a minor misfortune. Hope must have been an undying faculty of Margaret's nature, and at this crisis it animated her to exertions almost beyond the powers of woman. The winter was unusually severe, and she, the native of a southern clime, exposed herself unshrinkingly to every sort of hardship. Once more she sought and obtained assistance from the Scotch, and placed her devoted champion, Brise, at the head of the forces with which she was supplied. She then brought King Henry into the field, who had previously been hidden in her safe refuge at Harlet Castle. Their precious boy she left at Berwick, not wishing to expose his tender childhood, though by this time well inured to hardships, to a northern campaign during so inclement a winter. This was her first separation from her son, and doubtless it was keenly felt by Margaret, who was apt at times to forget the heroine in the mother. Success at first attended her efforts. The important fortresses of Bamborough, Alnwick, and Dunstanburg were taken by her, and garrisoned with Scotch and Frenchmen. But these alliances did her more harm than good with the people of England, and popular prejudice is always more terrible to princes than an army with banners. In the course of this campaign, a defection happened among her own party, for which Margaret was not prepared. Somerset, for whose house she had sacrificed so much, surrendered the castle of Bamborough to Warwick, on condition of receiving a pension from King Edward, and, with Suffolk and Exeter, carried their perjured homage to the throne of that monarch. This was followed by the fall of Dunstanburg and Alnwick. 
yet margaret continued courageously to struggle against fortune and speedily succeeded in winning back somerset exeter and percy to the banner of the red rose and also in retaking those fortresses in the spring of fourteen sixty three percy was defeated and slain at hedgeley moor by mortimer and a few days later england was again set on a field at the fatal battle of hexham king henry says hall was the best horseman of his company that day for he fled so fast no one could overtake him yet he was so closely pursued that three of his horsemen or bodyguard with their horses trapped in blue velvet were taken one of them wearing the unfortunate monarch's cap of state called a bicocket embroidered with two crowns of gold and ornamented with pearls when the victorious yorkists broke into the camp at levels margaret seized with mortal terror for the life of her boy fled with him on foot into an adjacent forest guarded only by de Brise. here in momentary dread of being overtaken by the foe she pursued her doubtful way by the most unfrequented paths before long she unfortunately fell in with a gang of robbers who attracted by the richness of her dress and that of the young prince surrounded and despoiled them of their jewels and costly robes of estate while they were quarrelling about the division of the plunder margaret whose intrepidity and presence of mind had been the means of extricating her from a similar peril when captured by lord stanley's followers after the battle of northampton snatched her son up in her arms and fled to a distant thicket unobserved by the pitiless ruffians who were deciding their dispute at swords points when the shades of evening closed round the fugitive queen and her son crept fearfully from their retreat and uncertain whither to turn for refuge began to thread the tangled mazes of the forest dreading above every other peril the misfortune of falling into the hands of king edward's partisans it was possible that one random turn might lead them into this very danger while margaret bewildered with doubt and alarm was considering what course to pursue she perceived by the light of the moon another robber of gigantic stature advancing towards her with a drawn sword gathering courage from the desperation of her situation margaret took her son by the hand and presenting him to the freebooter with the dignity of look and bearing that were natural to her she said here my friend save the son of your king struck with astonishment at the majestic beauty of the mother and the touching loveliness of the boy the robber dropped his weapon at the feet of the royal suppliants and offered to conduct them to a place of safety a few words explained to the queen that this outlaw was a lancastrian gentleman who had been ruined in king henry's service and she frankly committed herself and her son to his care taking the prince in his arms he led the queen to his own retreat a cave in hexham forest where the royal fugitives were refreshed and received such attention as his wife was able to afford strong confirmation is given to this incident by the local traditions of hexham and no one who has minutely surveyed the antiquities of that town can doubt of the fact the cave is in a most secluded spot on the south bank of the little rapid stream which runs at the foot of black hill it is still known by the name of queen margaret's cave and at the time it gave shelter to her and the prince of wales it must have been surrounded by forest it is about two miles from hexham the entrance to the cave is still very low and was formerly artfully concealed from sight its dimensions are thirty-four by fourteen feet the height will barely allow a full-grown person to stand upright a massive pillar of rude masonry in the centre of the cave seems to mark the boundary of the wall which it is said once divided it into two distinct apartments when warmed and cheered by fire and lamp it would not appear quite so dismal a den as at present such was the retreat in which the queen and prince remained perdue for two days of agonizing suspense on the third morning their host encountered sir pierre de Brise, who with his squire barville and an english gentleman having escaped the robbers at hexham had been making anxious search for her and the prince from these devoted friends margaret learned the escape of her royal husband and the terrible vengeance that had been executed on somerset and her faithful adherents the lords hungerford and ruse 
Margaret is said to have received these tidings with floods of tears, the first she had shed since the overthrow of the despairing hopes of Lancaster on the red field of Hexham. A few hours later, the English gentleman by whom Brise was accompanied, having gone into the neighboring villages to gather tidings of public events, encountered the Duke of Exeter and Edmund Beaufort, the brother and successor of the unfortunate Henry, Duke of Somerset. He conducted them to the retreat of the proscribed queen and the youthful hope of Lancaster. Margaret's spirits revived at the sight of these princes, whom she had numbered with the slain of Hexham and she determined to send them to their powerful kinsman, the Duke of Burgundy, to solicit an asylum at the court of Dijon, for herself and the Prince of Wales, while she once more proceeded to the court of Scotland, where she imagined King Henry had found refuge. On quitting the dwelling of the generous outlaw, from whom she had received such providential succor in her dire distress, she accorded all she had to bestow, her grateful thanks, but the Dukes of Somerset and Exeter, offered a portion of their scanty supply of money, as a reward to his wife, for the services she had rendered to the queen. But, with a nobility of soul worthy of a loftier station, she refused to receive any portion of that, which might be so precious to them at a time of need. Of all I have lost, exclaimed the queen, I regret nothing so much as the power of recompensing such virtue. Accompanied by Brise and his squire, and attended by the outlaw of Hexham, in the capacity of a guide, Margaret and the young prince, her son, took the road to Carlisle, where a passage to Scotland had been previously engaged for them, by the care of the gentleman who had accompanied Brise, and they safely landed at Kirkcud Bright. The treaty which had been concluded between King Edward and the Scottish Regency, rendered it necessary for Margaret to maintain a strict incognito, but there was an Englishman of the name of Cork, who was unfortunately well acquainted with her person, the majestic beauty of which it was scarcely possible to disguise. He was a Yorkist, and determined to open a path to fortune, by delivering to King Edward the last hope and support of the cause of the Red Rose. He had confederates in the town, and with their assistance, he surprised Margaret's brave protectors, Brise and his squire Barville, and hurried them on board a vessel which he had provided for the purpose, and with less difficulty succeeded in the abduction of the helpless queen and her son. Neither party was aware of the captivity of the other, till the first rays of the sun enabled the queen and Brise to recognize each other, and afforded a sad conviction of their peril. The great personal strength of Brise, however, had enabled him to extricate himself from his bonds in the course of the night, and he watched an opportunity for removing those of his squire. They were then two against five, but, having got possession of the oars, they contrived to master their opponents, and after a desperate struggle, slew some and threw the others overboard, not without extreme peril of upsetting the boat. After tossing for some hours in the Gulf of Solway, the wind drove the boat on a sandbank near Cantyre, where there appeared every chance of her being beaten to pieces by the waves. It was, however, so near the shore, that Brise, wading knee-deep in sand and water, succeeded in conveying the queen on his shoulders to a dry spot, and Barville performed the same service for the Prince of Wales. The coast they had gained was wild and barren, but here, at least, Margaret had no fear of being recognized, since the peasantry was so ignorant that they could not believe any one was a queen, unless she had a crown on her head and a scepter in her hand. In one of the obscure hamlets of this rude country, Margaret remained with her son, under the care of Brise, while she dispatched Barville to Edinburgh, to ascertain from public report the general state of affairs in England and the fate of King Henry. The tidings were such as to convince her that she must hoard her energies for better days, and though she privately visited Edinburgh, to try the effect of her personal eloquence once more, she only found that her presence caused great uneasiness to the government. All the favor she could obtain was assistance for returning to her friends in Northumberland, who still continued with determined valor to hold out the fortress of Bamborough. From this place, Margaret, with a heavy heart, embarked for Flanders with her son and some of her ladies, who had taken refuge there, after the disappearance of their royal mistress. 
Sir John Fortescue, who had abandoned his office as Lord Chief Justice of England, to follow the fortunes of the proscribed queen and his princely pupil. Dr. Morton, afterwards the famous Cardinal Archbishop of York, and about 200 of the ruined adherents of Lancaster, shared her flight. Her usual ill luck, with regard to weather, attended Margaret on this voyage. The first day she sailed, her vessel was separated by a terrible storm from its consort, and during twelve hours she expected every moment to be engulfed in the tempestuous waves, and when the violence of the hurricane abated, her ship was so greatly damaged that she was forced to put into the port of Ecluse, in the dominions of her hereditary enemy, the Duke of Burgundy. She left Prince Edward at Burges, and went on to Lilla, to meet the eldest son of Philip of Burgundy, Count de Charlois, whose mother was nearly related to Henry the Sixth. This prince came out of the town to meet Margaret, with the greatest marks of respect. From Melilla she passed on to Bethune, to meet Duke Philip. But, as he was at St. Paul, he sent a guard of archers for her escort, she having proposed travelling by the way of Hesdin, because she dreaded the skirmishing parties from the garrison of Calais. When she arrived at St. Paul, the Duke of Burgundy gave her a very honorable reception, and entertained her with grand festivities. When he understood her great pecuniary distress, and the painful straits to which her faithful followers were reduced, he, with truly princely munificence, presented to each of her ladies a hundred crowns. To Brise, who had expended the whole of his fortune in her service, a thousand, and to Margaret herself, he gave an order on his treasurer to pay her on the spot twelve thousand crowns. The treasurer took a base advantage of the misfortunes of the queen, by endeavoring to defraud her of half the money. Margaret, who was not of a spirit to put up tamely with such a wrong, informed the duke of the villainy of his minister. Philip, in a transport of indignation, ordered him to be put to death and the sentence would have been executed, but for Margaret's intercession in his favor. She was sensibly touched with the generous treatment she had experienced from the Duke of Burgundy, whom, from her cradle, she had regarded with the deepest rooted hostility, and had often been accustomed to say, that if by any chance he were to fall into her hands, she would make the axe pass between his head and shoulders. If this unfeminine and impolitic speech reached the ears of Philip the Good, he did not allow it to influence his conduct towards the fallen queen, when she condescended to become a suppliant for his bounty. But, remembering only that they claimed their descent from the same royal stock, he treated her in all respects as a princess of the House of France, and the consort of a king of England. He would not, however, violate his treaty with King Edward, nor suffer his subjects to be involved in her quarrel, but when she had stayed, as long as it pleased her to remain his guest, he sent her with an honorable escort to Bar, the dominion of her brother. King René felt deeply grateful for the hospitable welcome thus afforded to his distressed child, by his ancient antagonist and victor. He addressed a letter to Philip of Burgundy, full of thanks, declaring, he could not have expected, nor did he merit, such attentions. After quitting the court of Burgundy, Margaret traveled to Lorraine. She passed some days at St. Michel, with fifty nobles and gentlemen of her suite. Part of that year she sojourned with her sister, Yolante, Countess of Vadamante, and her noble-minded brother, John of Calabria. After this time she abode at Amboise, the court of the Queen of France. The distracted state of King René's affairs in his own dominions, utterly precluded him from exerting himself in his daughter's service, though not unfrequently solicited to draw his knightly sword in her cause. The Provencal bards took the heroism and misfortunes of their hapless princess for their theme, and René's own minstrel and namesake was accustomed to assail his royal ear, in festal halls, with these strains. Arouse thee, arouse thee, King René, nor let sorrow thy spirit beguile. Thy daughter, the spouse of King Henry, now weeps, now implores with a smile. René, however, was compelled to remain a passive sympathizer in Margaret's affliction. All he could do for her was to afford her an asylum in her adversity. 
he gave her the ancient castle of Curere, in the diocese of Verdun, near the town of St. Michel, for her residence, and contributed to her support, as far as his narrow means would allow. Here Margaret, bereaved of all the attributes of royalty, save those that were beyond the power of adverse fortune to alienate, dwelt with the remnant of her ruined friends, and occupied herself, in superintending the education of the last tender bud of the red rose of Lancaster, whom she yet fondly hoped to see restored to his country, and his former lofty expectations. During the seven years of their exile, Sir John Fortescue continued to reside with Queen Margaret and her son, and observing that his beloved pupil was too much taken up with martial exercises, he wrote his celebrated work on the Constitution of England, De Laudibus Legum Angle, to instruct him in a higher sort of knowledge, the true science of royalty. A deeper shade of gloom pervaded the exiled court of Margaret, when the tidings reached her, through her secret adherence in England, that her unfortunate consort had at length fallen into the hands of his successful rival. When King Henry fled from the lost battle of Hexham, he gained an asylum among his loyal subjects of Westmoreland and Lancashire, where he was many months concealed, sometimes in the house of John Mackle, at Crackenthorpe, sometimes like a hermit in a cave. There are even now traces of his residence in several of the northern halls and castles. The glove, boot, and spoon he left with his kind host, Sir Ralph could say, at Bolton Hall in Yorkshire, are still preserved. They were the only gifts fortune had left in his power to bestow. The size of the glove and boot show that his hands and feet were small. There is also a well where he used to bathe, which retains the name of King Henry's well. King Henry's retreat in Lancashire was betrayed by a monk of Abington, and he was taken by the servants of Sir John Harrington as he sat at dinner at Waddington Hall. He was conducted to London in the most ignominious manner, with his legs fastened to the stirrups of the sorry nag on which he was mounted, and an insulting placard affixed to his shoulders. At Islington he was met by the Earl of Warwick, who issued a proclamation forbidding any one to treat him with respect, and afforded an example of wanton brutality to the mob, by leading the royal captive thrice round the pillory, as if he had been a common felon, crying out, Treason! Treason! And behold the traitor! Henry endured these outrages with the firmness of a hero, and the meekness of a saint. Forsooth and forsooth, ye do foully to smite the Lord's anointed, was his mild rebuke to a ruffian, who was base enough to strike him in that hour of misery. The following touching lines which have been attributed to Henry the Sixth were probably written during his long imprisonment in the tower. Kingdoms are but cares, state is devoid of stay, riches are ready snares, and hasten to decay. Who meaneth to remove the rock out of his slimy mud, shall mire himself, and hardly scape, the swelling of the flood. There are preserved two sentences written and given by him to a knight, who had the care of him. Patience is the armor and conquest of the godly. This meriteth mercy, when causeless is suffered sorrow. Not else is war but fury and madness, wherein is not advice, but rashness, not right, but rage, ruleth and reigneth. Queen Margaret must have felt the indignity and cruelty with which her unoffending consort was treated as the greatest aggravation of all her own hard trials. She was still formidable to the reigning sovereign of England, who established a sort of coast guard to prevent her from effecting a sudden descent on the shores of England. It has been confidently asserted that Margaret herself visited England, disguised as a priest, in the train of the Archbishop of Narbonne, in 1467. William of Worcester records that various persons, who were apprehended on suspicion of having letters from Queen Margaret in their possession, were tortured and put to death. Sir Thomas Cook, a London alderman, was accused of treason, and fined 8,000 marks, because Hawkins, one of Margaret's agents, when put to the rack in the tower, confessed that he had attempted to borrow money for her of this wealthy knight. And though Sir Thomas Cook had refused to lend it, he was brought in great peril of his life, for not having disclosed the attempt of Hawkins. 
a poor shoemaker was pinched to death with red-hot pincers for assisting the exiled queen to carry on a correspondence with her adherents in england but he resolutely refused to betray the parties with whom margaret was in league when harlech castle was taken in the same year many letters to and from queen margaret fell into the hands of king edward an emissary of margaret who was taken in the stronghold of her outlawed adherents which had so long held out in defiance of edward and all his puissants accused the earl of warwick of having in his late mission to the continent spoken favorably of the exiled queen in his conference with louis the eleventh at rowan warwick refused to leave his castle to be confronted with his accuser two years afterwards he was in arms with the avowed intention of hurling edward the fourth from the throne but was forced to retreat to france where king louis received him end of section fifteen Section 16 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 3, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anne Boulay. Margaret of Anjou, Chapter 2, Part 3. Queen Margaret, in the December of 1469, left her lonely castle in Verdun, and came to Tours, with Prince Edward, to meet Louis XI her father, her brother, her sister Yolante, and fairy Count of Vadamante, who had all assembled there, to hold a council on the best means of improving the momentous crisis for the cause of Lancaster. Margaret and her father were so greatly agitated at the prospect that appeared opening for her in England, that, when they met, they embraced with floods of tears. Everyone present was moved, not even excepting the cold-hearted Louis XI who is said to have betrayed unwanted tokens of sensibility on this occasion. He had never shown the slightest sympathy in the griefs and calamities of his unfortunate kinswoman, but, in the circumstances that excited her hopes, he could perceive a prospect of great political advantages for himself, and now he treated her with all the respect and honor that her high rank and near relationship to him demanded, and exerted all his influence to effect a personal reconciliation between the exiled queen and the author of all her misfortunes, the Earl of Warwick. So deeply rooted was the animosity which Margaret cherished against this nobleman, that at first she positively refused to see or to speak to him. Nor can we greatly wonder at the nature of her feelings, when we reflect that, to the bitterness of twenty years of personal provocation against herself, commencing with the murder of the Duke of Suffolk, had lately been added the injurious and barbarous usage of her unoffending lord, King Henry. When Warwick arrived at Tours, he was introduced into the presence of Margaret by Louis XI, who, in the character of a mediator between these deadly foes, engaged to procure the queen's pardon for the earl. In this, says the chronicler, Queen Margaret was right difficult, and showed to the king of France, in presence of the Duke of Guienne, that with honor to herself and her son, she might not, and would not, pardon the said earl, who had been the greatest cause of the downfall of King Henry, and that never of her own spirit, might she be contented with him, nay pardon him. Queen Margaret showed, that it would be greatly prejudicial to pardon the Earl of Warwick, for in England, she and her son had certain parties and friends, which they might likely lose by this means, which would do them more hindrance than the Earl and his allies could do them good. Wherefore she besought the King of France, to leave off speaking for the said pardon and alliance. The Earl of Warwick on this entered into a defense of his conduct, owning that it was by his means the queen was dethroned, but that, before he had done or thought of doing her any harm, her false counselors had plotted his destruction, body and goods, and that no nobleman, outraged and despaired, driven to desperation, could have done otherwise. It does not appear that Warwick mentioned the execution of his father, the Earl of Salisbury, which is almost a confirmation of the statements of these historians, who deny that he was beheaded by Margaret. 
In this scene, Margaret seems to have demeaned herself more like an offended woman than a queen and a political leader. But the more loftily she spoke and looked, the more submissive her former adversary became. He told her, he had been the means of upsetting King Edward and unsettling his realm, and that he would, for the time to come, be as much his foe as he had formerly been his friend and maker. He besought the queen and prince, that so they would take him, and repute him, and forgive him all he had done against them, offering himself to be bounded by all manner of ways, to be their true and faithful subject for the time to come, and that he would set, for his surety, the king of France. King Louis, being then present, agreed to be surety, praying the Queen Margaret, that at his request she would pardon the Earl of Warwick, showing the great love he had to the said Earl, for whom he would do more than any man living. And so Queen Margaret, being likewise urged by the agents of King René, her father, after many treaties and messages, pardoned the Earl of Warwick, and so did her son also. The Earl of Oxford, who had, by the exigency of circumstances, been compelled to acknowledge the authority of the White Rose Sovereign for a while, came also with Warwick, to entreat Queen Margaret's forgiveness, and permission to renew his homage to the House of Lancaster. The Queen received his supplication in a very different spirit from that with which she accorded her forgiveness, if such it might be called, to Warwick, for she said, Your pardon is right easy to purchase, for well I know you and your friends have suffered much things for King Henry's quarrels. On the 15th of July they all proceeded to Angers, where the Countess of Warwick and her youngest daughter were presented to Queen Margaret, and a marriage between the Prince of Wales and the Lady Anne was proposed by Louis. Margaret treated the first overtures of this strange alliance with the most unqualified contempt. Edward the IV's brother Clarence had espoused the Lady Isabel, Anne's elder sister, and Margaret appears to have had an intuitive feeling of the danger of the connection. Touching the manner of the marriage, pursues the spy, the queen would not in any wise consent, or yield to any request the king of France might make her. Sometimes she said, that she saw never honor nor profit, ni for her, ni for her son the prince. Another time she, alleged that she would and she should find a more profitable party, and of more advantage with the king of England, Edward the Fourth. Indeed she showed to the king of France a letter, which she said was sent to her out of England that last week, by which was offered to her son, my lady princess. This was Elizabeth of York, then the heiress of Edward the Fourth. Queen Margaret persevered fifteen days before she would consent to the alliance with Warwick, to which, at last, by the advice of the counsellors of her father, King René, she agreed, and the marriage was promised in presence of the King of France and the Duke of Guienne, brother to Louis the Eleventh, according to the following articles. First, the Earl of Warwick swore upon the true cross at Angers, in St. Mary's Church, that without change, he shall always hold the party of King Henry, and serve him, the Queen and Prince, as a true and faithful subject oath to serve his sovereign lord. The King of France and his brother, then clothed in canvas robes, in the said church of St. Mary, swore they would help and sustain to the utmost of their power the Earl of Warwick, in the quarrel of King Henry. Queen Margaret then swore to treat the Earl as true and faithful to King Henry and the Prince, and for his deeds past, never to make him any reproach. After the recovery of the Kingdom of England, the Prince was to be regent of all the realm, and the Duke of Clarence to have all his own lands and those of the Duke of York. Item, from that time forth, the daughter of the Earl of Warwick shall be put and remain in the hands and the keeping of the Queen Margaret but the said marriage not to be perfected till the Earl of Warwick had been with an army over into England, and recovered the realm in the most part thereof for King Henry. The Earl of Warwick affirmed, at the same time, that if he were once over the sea, he should have more than fifty thousand fighters at his commandment. But if the King of France would help him with a few folk, he would pass the sea without delay. Louis gave a subsidy of forty-six thousand crowns, besides two thousand French archers. According to some of the French chroniclers, the Prince of Wales, who had entered his eighteenth year, and was one of the handsomest and most accomplished princes in Europe, 
was very desirous of becoming the husband of Anne Neville, whom he had seen at Paris some time before. They were allied in blood, for Anne's great-grandmother, the Countess of Westmoreland, was Joanna Beaufort, the daughter of John of Gaunt, the patriarchal stem of the royal line of Lancaster. Anne of Warwick was co-heiress to mighty possessions, which rendered her a match, in point of wealth, not unworthy of a spouse in full possession of regal power. While these negotiations were pending, Louise Queen gave birth to a fair son at Amboise, afterwards Charles the Eighth. Edward, Prince of Wales, was complimented with the office of godfather to the infant dauphin, the other sponsor being James of France. Some historians say that Margaret was the godmother, but there had never been any regard between her and the Queen of France, Charlotte of Savoy, who, being desirous of marrying her sister, Bona of Savoy, to Edward the Fourth, had always treated the fallen queen of the Lancastrian sovereign with a contempt that the high spirit of Margaret could scarcely brook. After the christening of the young dauphin, which was solemnized with great splendor at Amboise, Edward of Lancaster plighted his nuptial troth to Anne Neville in presence of Queen Margaret, the King of France, King René, and his second wife, Jeanne de Laval, the Earl and Countess of Warwick, the Duke and Duchess of Clarence, and the faithful adherents of the cause of the Red Rose, of whom Margaret's exiled court was composed. This romantic marriage was celebrated at the latter end of July, or the beginning of August, 1470, and was commemorated with feasts and high rejoicings. Warwick departed from Angers on the 4th of August, leaving his countess and newly wedded Princess of Wales as pledges of his fidelity, with Queen Margaret and her son. They were entertained with princely hospitality by King René till the autumn, when Margaret, her son and his bride, with the Countess of Warwick, proceeded to France, with a guard of honor for their escort. They arrived in November, and Margaret was received, with the express orders of Louis XI, with all the honors due to a queen of France. The Archbishop of Paris, the University, the Parliament, the officers of Châtelet, the provosts of the merchants, all in their habits of ceremony, both received her and conducted her out of the city. All the streets through which she passed, from the gate of St. Jock to the palace of St. Paul, were hung with rich tapestry, and nothing was omitted that could add to the solemnity of her reception. Matre Nicole Giles, in his history, says, The streets of Paris were gaily dressed to welcome them, and they were lodged in the palace, where they received the news of the landing of the Earl of Warwick, and that King Henry was freed and in possession of his kingdom, upon which Queen Margaret with all her company resolved to return to England. King René made great personal sacrifices, exhausting both money and credit, to assist his energetic daughter in her purveyances for the voyage to England, and in the month of February, 1471, all was ready for her embarkation, but the wind. The atmospherical influences were always unfavorable to Margaret, and at this momentous crisis of her fate, as on many a one previous, it might have been said, the stars in their courses fought against Cicera. Thrice did she, in defiance of all warnings from the men of Harfleur, put to sea with her armament, and as often was driven back on the coast of Normandy, not without damage to her ships till many of her followers protested that this strange opposition of winds and waves was caused by sorcery. Others endeavored to prevail on her to relinquish her intention of proceeding to England, as it appeared in a manner forbidden to her. But Margaret's strong mind rejected with equal contempt the superstitious motions of either magic or omens. She knew on how critical a balance hung the fortunes of her husband and her son, and although the people in all the towns through which Warwick had passed, on his triumphant march to London, had tossed the white rose from their caps, shouting, A Henry! A Henry! A Warwick! A Warwick! And celebrated the restoration of Holy Henry to the royal power with bonfires, and every token of popular rejoicing, yet she had too sore experience of the fickle nature of popular excitement, not to feel the importance of straining every nerve to improve the present favorable juncture. She was not ignorant of the return of King Edward and the defection of false perjured fleeting Clarence, and her anxiety to reach the scene of action, 
was closely proportioned to the desperate nature of the closely contested game that was playing there. Up to the last moment of her compulsory sojourn on the shores of Normandy, she continued to levy forces, and to raise munitions for the aid of Warwick and the king. On the 24th of March, she once more put to sea with her fleet, and despite of all opposing influences of the elements, pursued her inauspicious voyage to England. The passage, which with a favorable wind, might have been achieved in twelve hours, was protracted sixteen tedious days and nights, which were spent by the anxious queen in a fever of agonizing impatience. On Easter Eve, her long-baffled fleet made the port of Wymouth. Margaret, with her son the Prince of Wales, and his newly espoused consort, the prior of St. John's, called the treasurer of England, Sir John Montesquieu, Sir Henry Ruse, and many others, landed April 13th. They went immediately to the Abbey of Kern, a small religious house close by, to refresh themselves after the fatigues of the voyage. It was there that Queen Margaret, with the Prince and Princess of Wales, kept their Easter festival at the very time their cause was receiving its death blow on the fatal heath of Barnet, where the weather, as will be well remembered, once more turned the fortunes of the day against the fated Rose of Lancaster. When the dreadful news of the death of Warwick and the recapture of King Henry was brought to Margaret on the following day, she fell to the ground in a deep swoon, and for a long time remained in a speechless stupor of despair, as if her faculties had been overpowered by the greatness of this unexpected blow. When she revived to consciousness, it was only to bewail the evil destiny of her luckless consort. In her agony, she reviled the calamitous temper of the times in which she lived and reproached herself, says Hall, for all her painful labors, now turned to her own misery and declared, she desired rather to die than live longer in this state of infelicity, as if she foresaw the dark adversities that were yet in store for her. When the soothing caresses of her beloved son had in some manner restored her to herself, she departed with all her company, to the famous sanctuary of Beaulieu Abbey, where she registered herself and all who came with her as privileged persons. Here she found the Countess of Warwick, who had embarked at Harfleur at the same time with her, but, having a swifter sailing vessel, had landed before at Portsmouth, and proceeded to Southampton, with intent to join the Queen at Wymouth. On the road, the Countess had received the mournful news of her husband's defeat and death at Barnet, and, fearing to proceed, fled across the new forest. And so, says Fleetwood, took her to the protection of the sanctuary of an abbey called Beaulieu, which has as great privileges as that of Westminster, or of St. Martin's at London. A melancholy meeting it must have been between the despairing queen, the widow countess, and the princess of Wales, now so sorrowfully linked in fellowship of woe. As soon as the retreat of the queen was known, she was visited by the young fiery Duke of Somerset, and his brother, Jasper Tudor, the king's half-brother, and many of the Lancastrian nobles, who welcomed her to England. Finding her almost drowned in sorrow, they strove to rouse her from her dejection, by telling her, they had already a good puissance in the field, and trusted, with the encouragement of her presence and that of the prince, soon to draw all the northern and western counties to the banner of the Red Rose. The elastic spirits of Margaret were greatly revived and comforted by the cheering speeches of these ardent partisans, and she proceeded to explain to them the causes that delayed her coming to them, in time to support Warwick, and the reasons that had induced her to take sanctuary, which was for the security of the prince her son, for whose precious safety she passionately implored them to provide. She added, that it was her opinion no good would be done in the field this time, and therefore it would be best for her and the prince, with such as chose to share their fortunes, to return to France, and there to tarry till it pleased God to send her better luck. But the gallant young prince would not consent to this arrangement, and Somerset told the queen, with some warmth, that there was no occasion to waste any more words, for they were all determined, while their lives lasted, still to keep war against their enemies. Margaret, overborne by his violence, at last said, Well, be it so. 
She then consented to quit her asylum, and proceeded with the Lancastrian lords to Bath. It was a peculiarity in Margaret's campaigns, that she always kept the place of her destination a profound secret. Owing to this caution, and the entire devotion of the western counties to her cause, she had got a great army in the field, ready to oppose Edward the Fourth, while her actual locality remained unknown to him. He then advanced to Marlborough, but as her army was not equal in strength to his own victorious forces, she retreated from Bath to Bristol, with the intention of crossing the Severn at Gloucester, to form a junction with Jasper Tudor's army in Wales. Could this purpose have been effected, the biographers of Margaret of Anjou might have had a far different tale to record than the events of the dismal day at Tewkesbury. But the men of Gloucester had fortified the bridge, and would not permit her to pass, neither for threats nor fair words, though she had some friends in the city, through whom she offered large bribes. But they were under the obeisance of the Duke of Gloucester, they replied, and bound to oppose her passage. Margaret then passed on to Tewkesbury. Edward had arrived within a mile of that place before she came, and was ready to do battle with her. Though she had marched seven and thirty miles that day with her army, and was greatly overcome with vexation and fatigue, she was urgent with Somerset to press on to her friends in Wales, but Somerset, with inflexible obstinacy, expressed his determination, there to tarry, and take such fortune as God should send, and so, taking his will for reason, he pitched his camp in the fair park, and there entrenched himself, sorely against the opinion, not only of the queen, but all the experienced captains of the army. Somerset and his brother led the advance guard, the Prince of Wales, under the direction of Lord Wenlock, and the military monk, the prior of St. John's, commanded the van, the Earl of Devonshire, the rearward. When the battle was thus ordered, Queen Margaret and her son, the prince, rode about the field, and from rank to rank, encouraging the soldiers with promises of large rewards, promotions, and everlasting renown, if they won the victory. The fight commenced on the 4th of May. Our limits will not permit us to enter into the details of the battle, which was lost either through the treachery of Lord Wenlock, or the inconsiderate fury of Somerset, who, finding Wenlock inactively sitting on his horse in the marketplace of Tewkesbury, with his laggard host, when his presence was most required in the field, made fiercely up to him, and calling him, Traitor, cleft his skull with his battle axe. The men under Wenlock's banner, panic-stricken at the fate of their leader, fled. The Prince of Wales had no experience as a general, and his personal courage was unavailing to redeem the fortunes of the day. When Queen Margaret, who was an agonized spectator of the discomfiture of her troops, saw that the day was going against her, she could with difficulty be withheld from rushing into the melee. But at length, exhausted by the violence of her feelings, she was carried in a state of insensibility to her chariot, by her faithful attendants, and was thus conveyed through the gates of Tewkesbury Park, to a small religious house hard by, where her equally unfortunate daughter-in-law, Anne of Warwick, the Countess of Devonshire, and Lady Catherine Vaux, had already taken refuge. According to Fleetwood's Chronicle, she remained there till Tuesday, May 7th, three days after the battle. Other writers affirm that she was captured on the same day which saw the hopes of Lancaster crushed, with her gallant springing young Plantagenet, on the bloody field of Tewkesbury. The generally received historical tradition of the manner of the Prince of Wales' death has been contested because two contemporary chroniclers, Workworth and Fleetwood, have stated that he was slain in the field, calling on his brother-in-law Clarence for help. In the field he probably was slain, that part of the plain of Tewkesbury, which in memory of that foul and most revolting murder is still called the Bloody Field. Sir Richard Crofts, to whom the princely novice had surrendered, tempted by the proclamation, that whoever should bring Edward, called Prince, to the king, should receive one hundred pounds a year for life, and the prince's life be spared. Nothing mistrusting, says Hall, the king's promise brought forth his prisoner, being a goodly well-featured young gentleman of almost feminine beauty. King Edward, struck with the noble presence of the youth, after he had well considered him, demanded, 
how he durst so presumptuously enter his realms with banners displayed against him to recover my father's crown and mine own inheritance was the bold but rash reply of the fetter leonceau of plantagenet edward basely struck the gallant stripling in the face with his gauntlet which was the signal for his pitiless attendants to dispatch him with their daggers a small unadorned slab of grey marble in the abbey church of tewkesbury points out the spot where the last hope of anjou's heroine and the royal line of lancaster was consigned without funeral pomp to an unhonoured grave among the meaner victims of his victorious foe on the following day queen margaret's retreat was made known to king edward as he was on his way to worcester and he was assured that she should be at his command she was brought to him at coventry may eleventh by her old enemy sir william stanley by whom it is said the first news of the massacre of her beloved son was revealed to the bereaved mother in a manner that was calculated to aggravate the bitterness of this dreadful blow margaret in the first transports of maternal agony invoked the most terrible maledictions on the head of the ruthless edward and his posterity which stanley was inhuman enough to repeat to his royal master together with all the frantic expressions she had used against him during their journey edward was at first so much exasperated that he thought of putting her to death but no plantagenet ever shed the blood of a woman and he contented himself by forcing her to grace his triumphant progress towards the metropolis the youthful widow of her murdered son anne of warwick who had in one little fortnight been bereaved of her father her uncle her young gallant husband and the name of princess of wales some say was another of the mournful attendants on this abhorrent pageant on the twenty second of may being the eve of the ascension margaret and her unfortunate daughter-in-law entered london together in the train of the haughty victor and it is said by the romantic french biographer of margaret that they travelled in the same chariot but even if it were so they were separated immediately on their arrival and margaret was incarcerated in one of the most dismal of the prison lodgings in that gloomy fortress where her royal husband was already immured that husband to whom she was now so near after long years of separation and yet was to behold no more the same night that margaret of anjou was brought as a captive to the tower of london she was made a widow that night between eleven and twelve of the o'clock writes the chronicler in leland was king henry being prisoner in the tower put to death the duke of gloucester and divers of his men being in the tower that night may god give him time for repentance whoever he was who laid his sacrilegious hands on the lord's anointed as the continuator of the chroniclers of croyland Tradition points out an octagonal room in the Wakefield Tower as the scene of the midnight murder of Henry the Sixth. It was there that he had, for five years, eaten the bread of affliction during his lonely captivity from 1465. A few learned manuscripts and devotional books, a bird that was the companion of his solitude, his relics, and the occasional visits of one or two learned monks, who were permitted to administer to his spiritual wants, were all the solaces he received in his captivity about thirty years after his death a metrical life of henry the sixth was completed by a monk of windsor his contemporary it opens with a beautiful latin hymn of which with the assistance of a learned friend i am enabled to offer the reader a literal translation in the original metre salve me les precios one hail henry soldier of the lord in whom all precious gifts accord branch of the heavenly vine rooted in charity and love serenely blooming as above the saints angelic shine two hail flower of true nobility honor and praise and dignity adorn thy diadem meek father of the fatherless thy people succor in distress the church's strength and gem three hail pious king in thee we see the graces of humility with spotless goodness crowned by sorrow stricken and oppressed to those who vainly sigh for rest mirror of patience found four hail beacon of celestial light whose beams may guide our steps aright thy blessed course to trace 
in virtue's past for ever seen mild and ineffably serene radiant with every grace five hail whom the king of endless time hath called to angel choir sublime in realms for ever blessed may we who now admiring raise these unworthy notes of praise share thy glorious rest king edward and the duke of gloucester as if apprehensive of some outburst of popular indignation left london early in the same morning that the tragic pageant of exposing the corpse of their royal victim to public view was to take place an exhibition that was a matter of political expediency to prevent any further attempts for his deliverance the day after the ascension the last lancastrian king was borne barefaced on the bier surrounded by more glaives and bills than torches through cheapside to st paul's that every man might see him and there the silent witness of the blood that welled from his fresh wounds upon the pavement gave an indubitable token of the manner of his death the same awful circumstance occurred when they brought him to blackfriars and this is recorded by four contemporary authorities in quaint but powerful language very brief was the interval between the death and funeral of holy henry in the evening his bloody hearse was placed in a lighted barge guarded by soldiers from calais and so without singing or saying says the chronicler conveyed up the dark waters of the thames at midnight to his silent interment at chertsey abbey where it was long pretended that miracles were performed at his tomb whether the widow margaret was from her doleful lodgings in the tower a spectator of the removal of the remains of her hapless lord is not recorded but her extreme anxiety to possess them may be gathered from a curious document among the manuscripts in the royal archives at paris just before the melancholy period of her last utter desolation death had been busy in the paternal house of margaret of anjou her brother john of calabria his young promising heir and her sister's husband fairy of vadamonte and her natural sister blanche of anjou all died within a few weeks of each other king rene had not recovered from the stupor of despair in which he had been plunged by these repeated bereavements when he received the intelligence of the direful calamities that had befallen his unhappy daughter and for her sufferings he shed those tears which he had been unable to weep for his own under the influence of these feelings he wrote the following touching letter to margaret which she received in the midst of her agonies for the death of her husband and son my child may god help thee with his counsels for rarely is the aid of man tendered in such reverse of fortune when you can spare a thought from your own sufferings think of mine they are great my daughter yet would i console thee the imprisonment of queen margaret was at first very rigorous but it was after a time ameliorated through the compassionate influence of edward's queen elizabeth woodville who probably retained a grateful remembrance of the benefits she had formerly received from her royal mistress margaret was first removed to windsor and afterwards to wallingford where she seems to have been under the charge of the noble castellane alice chaucer duchess dowager of suffolk her old favorite at least such we think is the inference to be drawn from this observation in one of the paston letters dated july eighth fourteen seventy one and as for queen margaret i understand that she is removed from windsor to wallingford nigh to ulam to lady suffolk's place in oxfordshire five marks a week were allotted by edward the fourth for the maintenance of the unfortunate margaret during her imprisonment in wallingford castle her tender-hearted father king rene was unwearied in his exertions for her emancipation which was at length accomplished at the sacrifice of his inheritance of provence which he ceded to louis the eleventh at lyon in fourteen seventy five for half its value that he might deliver his beloved child from captivity yolante and her son murmured a little at this loss but they appeared nevertheless fond of margaret the agreement between edward the fourth and louis the eleventh for the ransom of margaret of anjou was finally settled august twenty ninth fourteen seventy five while edward was in france louis undertook to pay fifty thousand crowns for her liberation at five instalments 
The first installment of her ransom was paid to Edward's treasurer, Lord John Howard, November 3rd, the same year, and the bereaved and broken-hearted widow of the Holy Henry, after five years' captivity, was conducted from her prison at Wallingford Castle to Sandwich. In her journey through Kent, she was consigned to the care and hospitality of John Hout, a squire of that county, strongly in the interests of the House of York, who attended her to Sandwich, where she embarked. Her retinue, when she landed in France, according to Prevost, consisted of three ladies and seven gentlemen, but these must have been sent by the King of France, since the miserable sum allotted to Hout for her traveling expenses allows for little attendance. The feelings may be imagined with which she took a last farewell of the English shores, where, thirty years before, she had landed in the pride and flush of youthful beauty as its monarch's bride and all the chivalry of the land thronged to meet and do her honor. Now it was treason even to shed a tear of pity for her sore afflictions, or to speak a word of comfort to her. Truly might she have said, See if any sorrow be like unto my sorrow. She safely arrived at Dieppe in the beginning of January 1476. It was requisite for the validity of the deeds of renunciation she had to sign that she should be at liberty. Therefore, Sir Thomas Montgomery took her to Rouen, and on the 22nd resigned her to the French ambassadors. And on the 29th of January, she signed a formal renunciation of all her rights her marriage in England had given her. There is something touching in the very simplicity of the Latin sentence with which the deeds begin, that was wrung from the broken-hearted heroine, who had, through so many storms of adversity, defended the rights of her royal consort and son. While they remained in life, she would have died a thousand deaths, rather than relinquish even the most shadowy of their claims. But the dear ones were no more, and now... Ambition, pride, the rival names of York and Lancaster, with all their long-contested claims, what were they then to her? Passively, and almost as a matter of indifference, Margaret subscribed the instrument commencing, Ego Margarita, Olim in Regno Anglia Marietata, etc. I, Margaret, formerly in England married, renounce all that I could pretend to in England, by the conditions of my marriage, with all other things there, to Edward, now King of England. This deed did not afford her the title of queen, even in a retrospective view. She was simply Margaret, formerly married in England. At the same time, she signed a renunciation of her reversionary rights on her father's territories to Louis XI, but as there were several intermediate heirs, this was no great sacrifice. Margaret intended to take Paris in her journey home, in order to thank Louis XI for her liberation, but it did not suit that wily politician to receive her, and he sent a message advising her to make the best of her way to her father. The last spark of Margaret's high spirit was elicited at this discourtesy, and, declining the escort Louis XI had prepared for her at Rouen, she set out on her long wintry journey through Normandy, a resolution which had nearly occasioned the loss of her life. After Normandy had been conquered by Henry V, he had planted some colonies of English settlers in various towns and villages, and one or two of these settlements still remained in a wretched state, being unable to emigrate to their mother country. Margaret, wholly unconscious of these circumstances, meant to rest for the night, after her first day's journey from Rouen, in a town containing many of these malcontents. Curiosity led a crowd of them to gaze upon her at the inn, but when the word passed among them, that it was Margaret of Anjou returning from England to her father, murmurs arose. They declared that she had been the original cause of the English losing France, and consequently of all their misery, and that they would now take vengeance upon her. With these words, they made a rush to seize her, but fortunately she had time to gain her apartment, while two English gentlemen, her attendants, held her assailants at bay with their drawn swords, till the French authorities of the town, hearing the uproar, interfered and rescued the unhappy Margaret from this unexpected attack. She retraced her steps immediately to Rowan, and was glad to claim the protection she had before refused. 
We now come to that era of Margaret's life in which a noble author of our times, Lord Morpeth, in one exquisite line, describes her as Anjou's lone matron in her father's hall. Like Naomi, Margaret returned empty and desolate to her native land, but, not like her, attended by a fond and faithful daughter-in-law, for the unhappy widow of her son had been compelled to wed King Edward's brother, Richard of Gloucester, with whom public report had branded as the murderer of Henry the Sixth, and the idea of this alliance must have added a drop to the already overflowing cup of bitterness, of which the fallen queen had drunk so deeply. The home to which her father welcomed Margaret was at that time at Reculay, about a league from Angers, on the river Mayence, where he had a castle that commanded a view of the town, with a beautiful garden, and a gallery of paintings and sculpture, which he took delight in adorning with his own paintings, and ornamented the walls of his garden with heraldic designs carved in marble. It was in such pursuits as these that René, like a true Provençal sovereign, sought forgetfulness of his afflictions. But Margaret's temperament was of too stormy a nature to admit the slightest alleviation to her grief. Her whole time was spent in painfully retracing the direful scenes of her past life, and in passionate regrets for the bereavements she had undergone. The canker worm that was perpetually busy within, at length made its ravages outwardly visible on her person, and effected a fearful change in her appearance. The agonies and agitations she had undergone turned the whole mass of her blood. Her eyes, once so brilliant and expressive, became hollow, dim, and perpetually inflamed, from excessive weeping, and her skin was disfigured with a dry scaly leprosy, which transformed this princess, who had been celebrated as the most beautiful in the world, into a spectacle of horror. Villeneuve says, Margaret seldom left her retreat at Reculay, with the exception of one or two visits to the court of Louis XI. Another modern French historian mentions her, as the person who kept alive the interests of the Lancastrian party, for her kinsman, the young Earl of Richmond, of whom Henry the Sixth had prophesied, that he should one day wear the crown of England. But the generally received opinion is, that she, after her return to her own country, lived in the deepest seclusion. A Burgundian poet of her own times, George Castellane, wrote a poem called the Temple of Ruined Greatness, in which Margaret of Anjou is greatly celebrated. A little before his death, King René composed two beautiful canticles on the heroic action of his beloved daughter, Queen Margaret. This accomplished prince died in the year 1480. By his will, which is preserved among the manuscripts in the Bibliothèque du Roy, René bequeathed 1,000 crowns in gold to his daughter Margaret, Queen of England, and, if she remains in a state of widowhood, an annuity of 2,000 livres, and the Chateau of Canis for her abode. He wrote a letter on his deathbed to Louis XI, earnestly recommending to his care his daughter Margaret and his widow. After the death of King René, Margaret sold any reversionary rights which the death of her elder sister and her children might give her to the duchies of Lorraine, Anjou, Maine, Provence, and Bar, to Louis XI, for a pension of 6,000 livres. She executed this deed on the 19th day of November, 1480, in the great hall of the castle of Reculay, where in her girlhood she had received the ambassadors of England, who came to solicit her virgin hand for their sovereign. This pension was so unpunctually paid by Louis, that if Margaret had no other resource, she would have been greatly inconvenienced, especially as many of the ruined Lancastrian exiles subsisted on her bounty. King René, with his last breath, had consigned her to the care of an old and faithful officer of his household, Francis Benoles, Lord of Morens, who had shared all his struggles. This brave soldier took the fallen queen to his own home, the Chateau of Dampier, near Samour. The last tie that bound Margaret to the world was severed by the death of her father, and she wished to end her days in profound retirement. Her efforts to obtain the bodies of her murdered husband and son were ineffectual, 
but till the last day of her life she employed some faithful ecclesiastics in england to perform at the humble graves of her loved and lost ones the offices deemed needful for the repose of their souls on her deathbed she divided among her faithful attendants the few valuables that remained from the wreck of her fortunes and worn out with the pressure of her sore afflictions of mind and body she closed her troublous pilgrimage at the chateau of Dompierre, august twenty fifth in the fifty first year of her age she was buried in the cathedral of angers in the same tomb with her royal parents without epitaph or inscription or any other memorial excepting her portrait painted on glass in a window of the cathedral a tribute of respect was for centuries paid to her memory by the chapter of saint maurice who annually on the feast of all saints after the vespers for the dead made a semicircular procession round her grave singing a sub venite this was continued till the french revolution margaret's elder sister yolante survived her two years she had a beautiful daughter called margaret of anjou the younger maria louisa napoleon's empress possessed the breviary of this princess in which there is one sentence supposed to have been written by the once beautiful powerful and admired margaret queen of england her aunt venite de vanities toute la vanity end of section sixteen Section 17 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 3, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anne Boulay. Elizabeth Woodville, Chapter 1, Part 1. The 15th century is, above all other eras, remarkable for unequal marriages made by persons of royal station, then for the first time since the reigns of our plantagenets commenced was broken that high and stately etiquette of the middle ages which forbade king or kaiser to mate with partners below the rank of princesses in that century the marriage of the handsome edward the fourth with an english gentlewoman caused as much astonishment at the wondrous archery of dan cupid as was fabled of old when he shot so true that king cofatua wed the beggar maid but the mother of elizabeth woodville had occasion scarcely less wonder in her day when following the example of her sister-in-law queen catherine she a princess of luxembourg by birth and as the widow of the warlike duke of bedford the third lady of the realm chose for her second helpmate another squire of henry v richard woodville who was considered the handsomest man in england after the death of henry v woodville entered the service of the duke of bedford on whose death he was employed to escort the young widow who was but seventeen to england where she was dowered on the royal demesnes the duchess of bedford's marriage was kept secret full five years its discovery took place about the same time as that of the queen with owen tudor and certainly the duke of gloucester though his own love affairs were quite as astounding to the nation must have thought his two sisters-in-law had gone distracted with love for squires of low degree what scandals what court gossip must have circulated throughout england in the year of grace 1436. The Duchess's dower was forfeited in consequence of her marriage with Woodville, but restored on her humble supplication to Parliament, through the influence of her husband's patron, Cardinal Beaufort. Grafton Castle was the principal residence of the Duchess. Probably Elizabeth Woodville was born there, about 1431, some years before the discovery of her parents' marriage. Her father, Sir Richard Woodville, was one of the English commanders at Rowan, under the Duke of York, during that prince's regency. After the death of the unfortunate Queen Mother Catherine, and that of the Queen Dowager Joanna, the Duchess of Bedford became for some time, in rank, the First Lady in England, and always possessed a certain degree of influence in consequence. 
her husband was in the retinue sent to escort margaret of anjou to england he was afterwards rapidly advanced at court made baron and finally earl of rivers and the duchess of bedford became a great favorite of the young queen the duchess was still second lady in england yet her rank was many degrees more exalted than her fortune therefore as her children grew up she was glad to provide for them at the court of her friend queen margaret her eldest daughter the beautiful elizabeth woodville was appointed maid of honor to that queen little deeming that she was one day to fill her place on the english throne while yet in attendance on her royal mistress she captured the heart of a brave knight sir hugh johns a great favorite of richard duke of york sir hugh had nothing in the world wherewithal to endow the fair woodville but a sword whose temper had been proved in many a battle in france he was moreover a timid wooer and very impolitically deputed others to make to the beautiful maid of honor the declaration of love which he wanted courage to speak himself richard duke of york was protector of england when he thus in regal style recommended his landless vassal to the love of her who was one day to share the diadem of his heir to dame elizabeth woodville right trusty and well beloved we greet you for as much as we are credibly informed that our right hearty and well beloved knight sir hugh john for the great womanhood and gentleness approved and known in your person ye being sole single and to be married his heart wholly have wherewith we are right well pleased how be it of your disposition towards him in that behalf as yet is to us unknown we therefore as for the faith true and good lordship we owe unto him at this time and so will continue we desire and heartily pray ye will on your part be to him well willed to the performing of this our writing and his desire wherein ye shall do not only to our pleasure but we doubt not to your own great weal and worship in time to come certifying that if ye fulfill our intent in this matter we will and shall be to him and you such lord as shall be to both your great weal and worship by the grace of god who proceed and guide you in all heavenly felicity and welfare written by richard duke of york even if elizabeth's heart had responded to this earnest appeal of her lover's princely master yet she was too slenderly gifted by fortune to venture on a mere love match she probably demurred on this point and avoided returning a decisive answer for her delay elicited a second letter on the subject of sir hugh's great love and affection this time it was from the pen of the famous richard neville earl of warwick it is not written as if by a stranger to a stranger at the same time by his promises of good lordship patronage to elizabeth and her lover it is very evident he considers himself as the superior of both to dame elizabeth woodville worshipful and well beloved i greet you well and forasmuch my right well beloved sir hugh john knight which now late was with you unto his full great joy and had great cheer as he saith whereof i thank you hath informed me how that he hath for the great love and affection that he hath unto your person as well as for the great sadness seriousness and wisdom that he hath found and proved in you at that time as for your great and praised beauty and womanly demeaning he desireth with all haste to do you worship by way of marriage before any other creature living as he saith i considering his said desire and the great worship that he had which was made knight at jerusalem and after his coming home for the great wisdom and manhood that he was renowned of was made knight marshal of france and after knight marshal of england unto his great worship with other his great and many virtues and desert and also the good and notable service that he hath done and daily doth to me write unto you at this time and pray you effectuously that ye will the rather at this my request and prayer to condescend and apply you unto his said lawful and honest desire wherein ye shall not only purvey provide write notably for yourself unto your weal and worship 
profit and honor, in time to come, as I hereby trust, but also cause me to show unto you such good lordship, patronage, as ye by reason of it shall hold you content and pleased, with the grace of God, which everlastingly have you in his bliss, protection and governance. Written by the Earl of Warwick. No one can read this epistle without the conviction that the great Earl of Warwick had some ambition to become a matchmaker as well as a kingmaker. Nevertheless, Sir Hugh met with the usual fate of a lover who has not the spirit to speak for himself, and deputes his wooing to the agency of friends. He was rejected by the fair Elizabeth. He married a nameless damsel, and in the course of time died possessor of a single manor. A far different destiny was reserved for the lady of his love. The foregoing letters could not have been written till 1452. Elizabeth was that year 21, and she was then, as Richard of York says, sole and to be married. That is, she was single and disengaged, a remarkable crisis of her life, when in her maiden beauty she was eagerly wooed by the avowed partisans of the pale and the purple rose. Some worldly considerations, besides her duty to her royal mistress, Queen Margaret, seem to have led Elizabeth to reject the Yorkist partisan, Sir Hugh Johns, and accept the hand of the heir of the illustrious and wealthy lordship of Ferrers of Groby, a cavalier, firmly attached to the House of Lancaster. The time is not distinctly specified of the marriage of Elizabeth Woodville with John Gray. It probably took place soon after her rejection of the Yorkist champion. This wedlock was certainly a great match for the penniless maid of honor, for it was equal to several of the alliances of the Plantagenet princesses. John Gray was son and heir to Lord Ferrers of Groby, possessor of the ancient domain of Bradgate which was hereafter to derive such luster from being the native place of Elizabeth's descendant, Lady Jane Grey. Bradgate was Grey's patrimony, by reason of his descent from the proudest blood of our Norman nobility. Tradition declares that this was a most happy marriage, although Elizabeth and Grey must have been frequently separated by the ferocious contest between York and Lancaster, which commenced directly after their union. An adventure connected with the struggle for the crown, in the last stormy years of Henry the Sixth reign, placed young Edward Plantagenet, then Earl of March, and Earl Rivers, the father of Elizabeth, in extraordinary collision. The Earl of Rivers, and his son Sir Anthony, ardent partisans of Lancaster, were fitting out ships at Sandwich, by orders of Queen Margaret, in order to join the Duke of Somerset's naval armament, in 1458. At this time, Sir John Dinham, a naval captain in the service of Warwick, made a descent at Sandwich, and, surprising the Earl of Rivers and his son in their beds, carried them prisoners to Calais. How they were received there, William Paston shall tell, in one of his letters to a Norfolk knight, his brother. To my right worshipful brother be this letter delivered. As for tidings, the Lord Rivers was brought to Calais, and before the Lords by night, with eight score torches, and there my Lord of Salisbury raided him, calling him Knave's son, that such as he should be so rude as to call him, and these other Lords traitors, for they should be found the King's true liegemen, when such as he should be found a traitor. And my Lord of Warwick raided him, and said, his father was but a little squire, brought up with King Henry V, and since made himself by marriage, and also made a lord, and it was not his part to have held such language to those who were of king's blood. And my lord March rated him likewise, and Sir Anthony Woodville was likewise rated for his language by all the three lords. All this rating seems to have been the denouement of some old quarrel at court, with the Earl of March. As the Duke of York had not yet claimed the crown, but only the right of succession, his son dared not take the lives of Henry the Sixth's subjects in cold blood. Therefore, the Woodvilles escaped with the payment of ransom. Edward, Lord Ferrers, the father-in-law of Elizabeth, died December 18, 1457. The distraction of the times was such, 
that her husband had no opportunity of taking his place as Lord Ferrers in the House of Peers. He was then twenty-five, handsome, brave, and manly, the leader of Queen Margaret's cavalry, and an ardent and faithful partisan of her cause. Elizabeth had brought her husband two sons. One, born just before the death of Lord Ferrers, was named Thomas. The other name was Richard. These children were born at Bradgate, which, during the lifetime of her lord, was the home of Elizabeth. There is reason to believe that Elizabeth followed her lord in the campaign which Queen Margaret made in 1460. Prevost states that previously to the Second Battle of St. Albans, Queen Margaret persuaded Elizabeth to visit Warwick's camp, under pretense of requesting some little favor or assistance for herself, as it was known that the stout earl was very partial to her. But in reality, Elizabeth acted as a spy for her royal mistress. Elizabeth's husband, Grey, Lord Ferrers, commanded the cavalry of Queen Margaret during that furious charge which won the day for Lancaster, at the Second Battle of St. Albans. The Red Rose was, for a brief space, triumphant, but the young victorious leader died of his wounds the 28th of February, 1461, and his beautiful Elizabeth was left desolate. Fortunately, her mother was near the army, if not with Queen Margaret. Several chroniclers declare that Henry the Sixth knighted Elizabeth's husband at the village of Colney. Therefore, Grey must have survived the battle. A rancor so deep and deadly was cherished against the memory of Elizabeth's gallant husband, that his harmless infants, the eldest not more than four years old, were deprived of their inheritance of Bradgate, and Elizabeth herself remained a mourning and destitute widow in her native bowers of Grafton, at the accession of Edward the Fourth. The mother of Elizabeth was a diplomaste of most consummate ability, insomuch that the common people attributed her influence over the minds of men to sorcery. The manner in which she reconciled herself to young Edward, when she had so lately been aiding and abetting Queen Margaret, after the stormy scene that had occurred between that prince and her lord and son at Calais, and after her son-in-law had by his valor almost turned the scale of victory against the house of York, is really unaccountable. But the effect of her influence remains in no equivocal terms on the issue rolls of Edward's exchequer. In the first year of his reign, there is an entry declaring that the king affectionately considering the state and benefit of Jaquetta, Duchess of Bedford, and Lord Rivers, of his especial grace, not only pays her the annual stipend of her dower, 333 marks, four shillings and a third of a farthing, but actually pays 100 pounds in advance, a strong proof that Edward was on good terms with the father and mother of Elizabeth, three years before he was ostensibly the lover of their daughter. Is it possible that the fair widow of Sir John Grey first became acquainted with the victor, in the depths of her distress, for the loss of her husband, and that Edward's sudden passion for her induced his extraordinary profession of affection for her mother and father, who were, till the death of Sir John Grey, such staunch Lancastrians? If this singular entry in the issue rolls may be permitted to support this surmise, then did the acquaintance of Elizabeth and Edward commence two or three years earlier than all former histories have given reason to suppose. Whatever be the date of this celebrated triumph of love over sovereignty, tradition points out precisely the scene of the first interview between the lovely widow and the youthful king. Elizabeth waylaid Edward the Fourth in the forest of Whittlebury, a royal chase, when he was hunting in the neighborhood of her mother's dower castle at Grafton. There she waited for him, under a noble tree, still known in the local traditions of Northamptonshire, by the name of the Queen's Oak. Under the shelter of its branches, the fair widow addressed the young monarch, holding her fatherless boys by the hands, and when Edward paused to listen to her, she threw herself at his feet, and pleaded earnestly for the restoration of Bradgate, the inheritance of her children. Her downcast looks and mournful beauty not only gained her suit, but the heart of the conqueror. 
the queen's oak which was the scene of more than one interview between the beautiful elizabeth and the enamoured edward stands in the direct tract of communication between grafton castle and whittlebury forest it now rears its hollow trunk a venerable witness of one of the most romantic facts that history records if the friendly entry in the issue rolls be taken for data of elizabeth's acquaintance with edward the fourth he became acquainted with her soon after the battle of towton thus she was little more than twenty-nine when she first captivated him and her delicate and modest beauty was not yet impaired by time edward tried every art to induce Elizabeth to become his own on other terms than as the sharer of his regal dignity. The beautiful widow made this memorable reply. My liege, I know I am not good enough to be your queen, but I am far too good to become your mistress. She then left him to settle the question in his own breast, for she knew he had betrayed others, whose hearts had deceived them into allowing him undue liberties. Her affections, in all probability, still clave to the memory of the husband of her youth, and her indifference increased the love of the young king. The struggle ended in his offering her marriage. The Duchess of Bedford, when she found matters had proceeded to this climax, took the management of the affair, and, pretending to conceal the whole from the knowledge of her husband, arranged the private espousals of her daughter and the king. In the quaint words of Fabian, the marriage is thus described. In most secret manner, upon the 1st of May, 1464, King Edward espoused Elizabeth, late being wife of Sir John Grey, which spousals were solemnized early in the morning at the town called Grafton, near to Stony Stratford, at which marriage was none present but the spouse, Edward, and the spousess, Elizabeth, the Duchess of Bedford, her mother, the priest and two gentlewomen, and a young man who helped the priest to sing. After the spouse, the king again rode to Stony Stratford, as if he had been hunting, and then returned at night. And within a day or two, the king sent to Lord Rivers, father to his bride, saying that he would come and lodge with him for a season, when he was received with all due honor, and tarried there four days, when Elizabeth visited him by night so secretly, that none but her mother knew of it. And so the marriage was kept secret till it needs must be discovered, because of princesses offered as wives to the king. There was some obloquy attending this marriage, how that the king was enchanted by the Duchess of Bedford, or he would have refused to acknowledge her daughter. In the course of the summer of 1464, the king's marriage was discussed at court, though he yet delayed its public acknowledgment. His great desire was to prove to his peers that Elizabeth, being a descendant of the House of Luxembourg, was as worthy to share his throne as her mother was to marry the brother of Henry V. With this idea, he sent an embassy to his ally Charles, Count of Charlois, asking him to induce some of the princes of the House of Luxembourg to visit England, and claim kindred with his wife. From the remarks Monstrelet makes on this head, it may be gathered that the princes of Luxembourg had wholly forgotten and lost sight of the mother of Elizabeth. It is certain that they had been incensed at her marriage with Richard Woodville, for he says, Richard was the handsomest man in all England, and Jacquetta was an exceedingly handsome gentlewoman. Yet they never could visit the continent, or her brother Count Louis St. Paul would have slain them both. Jacquetta was gradually forgotten, till the extraordinary advancement of Elizabeth, and the message of her royal lord revived the remembrance of her Flemish relatives, and the Count of Charlois sent word, that the coronation of Elizabeth would be attended by her kindred. Of all persons, the marriage of Elizabeth gave the most offense to the mother of Edward the Fourth. This lady, who had assumed all the state of a queen, before the fall of her husband, Richard, Duke of York, at Wakefield, was infuriated at having to give place to the daughter of a man who commenced his career as a poor squire of ordinary lineage. Among other arguments against her son's wedlock was, that the fact of Elizabeth being a widow ought to prevent her marriage with a king, since the sovereignty would be dishonored by such bigamy. The king merrily answered, 
she is indeed a widow and hath children and by god's blessed lady i who am but a bachelor have some too madam my mother i pray you be content for as to the bigamy the priest may lay it in my way if ever i come to take orders for i understand it is forbidden to a priest but i never wist it was to be a king this is the version king edward's courtiers chose to give of the conversation but there is little doubt the duchess of york reproached her son with the breach of his marriage contract with elizabeth lucy the predecessor of elizabeth woodville in the affections of edward bitterly was this perfidy afterwards visited on the innocent family of the royal seducer edward was likewise supposed to be married to lady eleanor butler the daughter of the great earl of shrewsbury possibly this was a betrothment entered into in edward's childhood end of section seventeen section eighteen of lives of the queens of england volume three by agnes and elizabeth strickland this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by anne boulet Elizabeth Woodville, Chapter 1, Part 2. It was at the ancient palace of Reading, on Michaelmas Day, 1464, that Edward IV finally declared Elizabeth to be his wedded wife. A council of the peers was convoked there, when the king took Elizabeth by the hand and presented her to them as his rightful queen. She was then led by the young Duke of Clarence, in solemn pomp, to the stately abbey church of reading where she was publicly declared queen and having made her offering received the congratulations of all the nobility assembled there among whom some authorities declare was the earl of warwick a portrait of elizabeth woodville to be found in a fine illumination in the harleian collection in the british museum represents her in the costume in which she first appeared as a royal bride at reading the manner in which elizabeth's hair is arranged proves that the limning was drawn while she was a bride she wears a lofty crown of peculiar richness the numerous points of which are finished with fleur-de-lis her hair with the exception of a small ring in the middle of the forehead is streaming down her back and reaches to her knees it is pale yellow and its extreme profusion agrees with the description of the chroniclers she is very fair her eyelids are cast down in an affected look of modesty which gives a sinister expression to her face her attire is regal the material of her dress is a splendid kind of gold brocade in stripes called bodikins which was solely appropriated to the royal family it is a garter blue of a column pattern alternating with gold the sleeves are tight the bodice close fitting with robings of ermine turned back over the shoulders it is girded round the waist with a crimson scarf something like an officer's sash the skirt of the dress is full with a broad ermine border and finishes with a train many yards in length this is partly held up by the queen while the extremity is folded round the arms of a train bearer who is probably one of elizabeth's sisters a rich blue satin petticoat is seen beneath the dress, and the shoes are of the pointed form, called sometimes crocows, and sometimes pignancies. The queen wears a pearl necklace strung in an elaborate pattern, called a device. Although Edward IV was at times notoriously unfaithful to his queen, and other women occasionally seduced him from her, yet over his mind, Elizabeth, from first to last, certainly held potent sway an influence most dangerous in the hands of a woman who possessed more cunning than firmness more skill in concocting a diplomatic intrigue than power to form a rational resolve she was ever successful in carrying her own purposes but she seldom had a wise or good end in view the advancement of her own relatives and the depreciation of her husband's friends and family were her chief objects elizabeth gained her own way with her husband by an assumption of the deepest humility her words were soft and caressing her glances timid the acknowledgment of elizabeth's marriage was followed by a series of the most brilliant feats and tournaments that had been witnessed in england since the establishment of the order of the garter by edward the third 
At these scenes, Elizabeth presided, surrounded by a virgin train of lovely sisters, who were the cynosure of the eyes of the unmarried baronage of England. Although these nobles had suffered all the portionless daughters of the Duchess of Bedford to reach ages from twenty to thirty, unwooed and unwedded, yet they now found that no beauties were comparable to the sisters of her whom the king delighted to honor. The exultation of so many fair rivals did not add to the new-made queen's popularity with the female nobility of England, while her heroic brother, Anthony Woodville, by his beauty, his learning, and his prowess in the tilt-yard, with better reason, raised considerable envy among his own sex. Elizabeth incensed the ancient nobility by the activity with which she made it her numerous tribe among the greatest heirs and heiresses of the realm. Anthony Woodville married the orphan of Lord Scales, the richest heiress in the kingdom, whom the Duchess of York designed for her son Clarence. Neither infantine juvenility, nor the extreme of dotage, seems to have been objected by the Woodvilles, if there were a superfluity of the goods of this world. For the queen's eldest brother, a fine young man, wedded, for his great jointure, Catherine, the dowager duchess of Norfolk, then in her eightieth year. A diabolical marriage, wrathfully exclaims William of Worcester. Soon after the queen had made the match between the young heiress of Scales and her brother Anthony, the ladies of England chose that gallant knight to sustain the honor of his country at the tournament they expected would be proclaimed in celebration of Elizabeth's coronation. On the Wednesday before Easter Day, 1465, on the return of Sir Anthony Woodville from High Mass, with his royal sister, at the chapel of the Sheen Palace, a bevy of her ladies surrounded him, and by the presentation of a gold knee-band figured with S.S., and ornamented with a forget-me-not, gave some mystical intimation that he was expected to remember his knightly devour, of high emprise, at the coronation of his sister. The antagonist he selected was the most renowned champion of Europe, being Count de la Roche, illegitimate son of Philip of Burgundy and the constant companion of all the rash enterprises of his brother Charles the Bold, whether in field or tourney. To this opponent, Anthony Woodville, who had now adopted the title of Lord Scales, in right of his lady, thus wrote from the Palace of Sheen. Truth it is, that the Wednesday next before the solemn and devout resurrection of our blessed Savior and Redeemer, for certain causes, I drew me near toward the Queen of England and of France, my sovereign lady, to whom I am right humble servant, subject and brother. And as I spoke to her highness, on my knees, my bonnet off my head, according to my duty, I know not how it happened, but all the ladies of her court environed me about, and anon I took heed that they had tied above my left knee a band of gold, garnished with precious stones, which formed a letter, it was a collar of S.S., meaning souvenance or remembrance, which, when I perceived, truth to say, it came nigher to my heart than to my knee and to this collar was hanging a noble flower of souvenance, enameled and in manner of emprise. And then one of the ladies said to me full sweetly, that I ought to take a step fitting for the time. Then each of them withdrew demurely to their places, and I, all abashed at this adventure, rose up to go and thank them for their rich and honorable present. But when I took up my cap, I found in it a letter written on vellum, and only closed and bound with a gold thread. Now I thought this letter contained the will of the ladies expressed in writing, and that I should know the adventure which the flower of souvenance was given me to undertake. Then humbly did I thank the queen, who of her grace had permitted such honor to be done me in her noble presence, and especially did I thank the ladies for their noble present. I went forthwith to the king of England, my sovereign lord, to show him the emprise, and that he would give me leave and license to accomplish the contents of the said letter, to bring the adventure of the flower of souvenance to a conclusion. King Edward broke the thread of gold, he read the articles of combat, and permitted the jousts. Then Woodville forwarded the articles of combat, and the enamel jewel of forget-me-not, to the Count de la Roche, by a herald, requesting him, to touch the flower with his worthy and knightly hand, in token of his acceptance of the challenge. 
the count did so and expected to be one of the knights sent by charles the bold to do honor to the coronation tournament of the queen the coronation of elizabeth was appointed at westminster abbey whit sunday the twenty sixth of may on Whitsun Eve, the Queen entered London from Eltham Palace, the mayor and city authorities meeting her at the foot of Shooter's Hill, and conducting her through Southwark to the Tower. That morning, Edward kept court at the Tower, where he knighted thirty-two persons, among whom were five judges and six citizens, and behaved with the utmost popularity, in order to obtain the favor of the citizens for his Queen. She was carried through the city to her palace of Westminster in a litter borne on long poles, like a sedan chair, supported by stately pacing steeds. The new-made knights all rode, on this occasion, in solemn procession before the queen's litter. She was crowned next day, with great solemnity, in Westminster Abbey, the young Duke of Clarence officiating as high steward. After the coronation, the queen sat in state at a grand banquet in Westminster Hall, where the Bishop of Rochester, who sang the mass at her consecration, took his place at the king's right hand, and the Duke of Buckingham, now the king's brother-in-law, by reason of his wedlock with Catherine Woodville, sat at his left. Charles the Bold fulfilled his promise of sending to England a sovereign prince of Elizabeth's kin, to convince the Londoners that Edward had taken to himself a helpmate of princely alliances. Count James of St. Paul, uncle to the Duchess of Bedford, landed at Greenwich some days before the coronation, and brought with him, not the champion of Burgundy, challenged by the queen's brother, but a hundred knights with their servants. These Flemish chevaliers constituted an armed band of mercenaries, ready to aid in enforcing obeisance, if any opposition had occurred at the recognition of Elizabeth as queen consort. The king regularly paid them for their attendance, for he presented the Count de St. Paul with three hundred nobles, each of his chevaliers with fifty. Elizabeth's marriage with Edward the Fourth drew upon them the enmity of no less a person than the celebrated Isabel of Castile, Queen of Spain. In the Harleian manuscripts is a letter from the Spanish ambassador, Granfidius de Sanciola, who uses these remarkable words. The Queen of Castile has turned in her heart from England in time past for the unkindness she took of the King of England, Edward the Fourth, whom God pardon for his refusing her and taking to wife a widow woman of England, for which cause there was mortal war between him and the Earl of Warwick, even to his death. The benefactions which Margaret of Anjou had bestowed upon Cambridge were continued by her successor, for early in 1465 Elizabeth appropriated a part of her income to the completion of the good work of her former mistress, and Queen's College owes its existence to these royal ladies. Anjou's heroine and the paler rose, the rival of her crown and of her woes. The enmity between Elizabeth and Warwick had not at this time amounted to anything serious, since he stood as godfather to her eldest daughter, born at Westminster Palace, 1466. The baptism of this princess for a while conciliated her two grandmothers, Cicely, Duchess of York, and Jaquetta, Duchess of Bedford, who were likewise her sponsors. The christening was performed with royal pomp, and the babe received her mother's name of Elizabeth, a proof that Edward was more inclined to pay a compliment to his wife than to his haughty mother. Some months after the queen had brought an heiress to the throne, she ventured on another affront to the all-powerful minister, general, and relative of her royal lord. Warwick had set his mind on marrying Anne, the heiress of the Duke of Exeter, to his nephew, George Neville. Meantime, the queen slyly brought the consent of the rapacious Duchess of Exeter for 4,000 marks, and married the young bride to her eldest son by Sir John Gray at Greenwich Palace, October 1466. The queen's eagerness for wealthy alliances was punished by the loss of her purchase money, for the heiress of Exeter died in her minority. As prime minister, relative, and general of Edward IV, Warwick had, from 1460 to 1465, borne a sway in England almost amounting to despotism. This influence was gradually transferred to the queen's family. 
Edward had likewise so far forgotten gratitude and propriety as to have offered some personal insult to a female relative of Warwick, generally supposed to be Isabel, his eldest daughter, who was, as the old chroniclers declare, the finest young lady in England. This conduct was the more aggravating, since Warwick had certainly delayed his master's marriage with various princesses, in hopes that, as soon as Isabel was old enough, Edward would have made her his queen, a speculation forever disappointed by the exultation of Elizabeth Grey. Warwick gave his daughter Isabel in marriage to the Duke of Clarence, and England was soon after in a state of insurrection. As popular fury was especially directed against the Queen's family, the Woodvilles were advised to abscond for a time. The first outbreak of the muttering storm was a rebellion in Yorkshire, under a freebooter called Robin of Reddesdale, declared by some to have been a noble, outlawed for the cause of the Red Rose. The insurgent defeated Edward the Fourth's forces at Edgecote, and pursuing the fugitives from the field into the forest of Dean, found there concealed the queen's father, who was then high treasurer, with his eldest son John. They were in the names, if not by the order, of Clarence and Warwick, hurried to Northampton and beheaded, without judge or jury. For the queen's mother, a still more fearful doom was intended. One of those terrific accusations of witchcraft was prepared against her, which were occasionally aimed at ladies of royal rank, whose conduct afforded no mark for other calumny. This was the third accusation of the kind, which had taken place in the royal family since the year 1419. The queen was preparing to accompany her husband in a progress into Norfolk, when this astounding intelligence reached her. The murder of her father and brother appears to have taken place in the middle of harvest, 1469. The blow must have fallen with great severity on Elizabeth, whose affections were knit so strongly to her own family. When the king advanced to the north in order to inquire into these outrages, he was detained in some kind of restraint by Warwick and his brother Montague at Warwick Castle, where an experiment was tried to shake his affections to Elizabeth, by the insinuation that her whole influence over him proceeded from her mother's skill in witchcraft. For this purpose, Thomas Wake, a partisan of the Neville faction, brought to Warwick Castle part of the stock in trade of a sorceress, which he declared was captured at Grafton. Edward was far from being proof against such follies, yet this accusation seems to have had no effect on his mind. After being carried to Middleham Castle, Warwick's stronghold in the north, where he was detained some time, he entered into negotiations for marrying his infant heiress, Elizabeth of York, with young George Neville. This scheme greatly displeased the uncle and godfather of the boy, the Archbishop of York, who persuaded his brothers to let Edward stay with him at his seat called the Moor, in Hertfordshire. Warwick sent up Edward, very severely guarded, from Middleham Castle. From the Moor, Edward escaped speedily to Windsor, and was soon once more in his metropolis, which was perfectly devoted to him, and where, it appears, his queen had remained in security during these alarming events. Again England was his own, for Warwick and Clarence, in alarm at his escape from the moor, betook themselves to their fleet and fled. But the queen's gallant brother, Anthony Woodville, who had the command of the Yorkist navy, intercepted and captured all the rebel ships, excepting that in which Warwick and Clarence, with their families, escaped with difficulty to France. The queen was placed by the king in safety in the tower before he marched to give battle to the insurgents. Her situation gave hopes of an addition to the royal family. She was the mother of three girls, but had not borne male heirs to the house of York. Edward soon found that a spirit of disaffection was busy in his army. He narrowly escaped, being surrendered once more into the power of Warwick, who had returned to England, but being warned by his faithful sergeant of minstrels, Alexander Carlyle, he fled half-dressed from his revolting troops in the dead of night, and embarked at Lynn with a few faithful friends. Elizabeth was thus left alone with her mother to bide the storm. She was resident at the tower, where her party still held Henry the Sixth the prisoner. 
while danger was yet at a distance the queen's resolutions were remarkably valiant she victualled and prepared the metropolitan fortress for siege with great assiduity but the very day that warwick and clarence entered london in a truly feminine panic elizabeth betook herself to her barge and fled up the thames to westminster not to her own palace but to a strong gloomy building called the sanctuary which occupied a space at the end of st margaret's churchyard here she registered herself her mother her three little daughters elizabeth mary and cicely with the faithful lady scrope her attendant as sanctuary women and in this dismal place she awaited with a heavy heart the hour in which the fourth child of edward the fourth was to see the light on the first of november fourteen seventy the long hoped for heir of york was born during this dark eclipse of the fortunes of his house the queen was in want of everything but thomas milling abbot of westminster sent various conveniences from the abbey close by mother cobb a well-disposed midwife resident in the sanctuary charitably assisted the distressed queen in the hour of maternal peril and acted as a nurse to the little prince nor did elizabeth in this fearful crisis want friends for master sarago her physician attended herself and her son while a faithful butcher, John Gould, prevented the whole sanctuary party from being starved into surrender by supplying them with half a beef and two muttons a week. The little prince was baptized, soon after his birth, in the abbey, with no more ceremony than if he had been a poor man's son. Thomas Milling, the abbot of Westminster, however, charitably stood godfather for the little prisoner, and the Duchess of Bedford and Lady Scrope were his godmothers. The sub prior performed the ceremony, and they gave him the name of his exiled sire. Early in March, the queen was cheered by the news that Edward the Fourth, her royal lord, had landed at Ravenspur, and soon after that his brother, Clarence, forsook Warwick. From that moment, the revolution of his restoration was as rapid as that of his deposition. When Edward drew near the capital, he sent, on the ninth of April, 1470, very comfortable messages to his queen, and to his true lords, servants, and lovers, who advised and practiced secretly how he might be received and welcome in his city of London. The result was that the metropolis opened its gates for Edward the Fourth, and the tower, with the unresisting prisoner, King Henry, was surrendered to him. Edward hurried to the sanctuary, and comforted the queen, that had a long time abided there, the security of her person resting solely on the great franchises of that holy place, sojourning in deep trouble, sorrow, and heaviness, which she sustained with all manner of patience belonging to any creature, and as constantly as ever was seen by any person, of such high estate to endure, in the which season, nathless, she had brought into this world, to the king's greatest joy, a fair son, a prince, wherewith she presented her husband at his coming, to his heart's singular comfort and gladness, and to all them that him truly loved. The very morning of this joyful meeting, Elizabeth, accompanied by her royal lord, left the sanctuary. Never before had Westminster Sanctuary received a royal guest, and little was it ever deemed a Prince of Wales would first see light within walls that had hitherto only sheltered homicides, robbers, and bankrupts. The ruthless wars of the roses, indeed, made the royal and the noble acquainted with strange housemates, but never did the power of sanctuary appear so great a blessing to human nature, as when the innocent relatives of the contending parties fled to the altar for safety. Like all benefits, sanctuary was abused, but assuredly it sheltered many a human life in these destructive and hideous contests. The same day that Edward the Fourth took Elizabeth out of sanctuary, he carried her to the city, where he lodged her and her children in his mother's palace, Castle Baynard, a Bastille-built fortification, which had been held in his father's time, when the Tower of London was untenable. Here Edward and his queen heard divine service that night, and kept Good Friday solemnly next day. On Easter Sunday, Edward gained the Battle of Barnet, and the deaths of Warwick and Montague, ensured the ultimate success of the House of York. 
Elizabeth remained at the tower while her husband gained the Battle of Tewkesbury. The news of his success had scarcely reached her, before the tower was threatened with storm by Falcon Bridge, a relative of the Earl of Warwick, and therein, says Fleetwood, was the queen, my lord prince, the ladies the queen's daughters, all likely to stand in the greatest jeopardy that ever was, from the formidable attack of this last partisan of Lancaster. But the queen's valiant brother, Anthony Woodville, was there, and the queen, relying on his gallant aid, stood the danger this time without running away. But assuredly, nature had never intended Elizabeth for an Amazon. After Edward had crushed rebellion, by almost exterminating his opponents, he turned his attention to rewarding the friends to whom he owed his restoration. He sagaciously considered that the interesting situation in which his wife had placed herself during his exile had greatly contributed to his ultimate success. Indeed, the feminine helplessness of Elizabeth Woodville and the passive resignation with which she endured the evils and inconveniences of the sanctuary house, in the hour of maternal weakness and agony, had created for her a tender regard throughout the realm, that actually did more benefit to the cause of York than the indomitable spirit of Margaret of Anjou, effected for the opposite party. Wonder and affection were awakened for Elizabeth, and, during the winter of 1470-71, to 71, tidings of the queen's proceedings in sanctuary were the favorite gossip of the matrons of london edward the fourth bestowed princely rewards on those humble friends who had aided his elizabeth as he calls her in that fearful crisis end of section eighteen Section 19 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 3, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anne Boulay. Elizabeth Woodville, Chapter 2, Part 1. Elizabeth's court is described in a lively manner by an eyewitness who was her guest, both at Windsor and Westminster, in 1472. This person was Louis of Burges, Lord of Grothus, Governor of Holland, who had hospitably received Edward when he fled in the preceding year from England, and landed with a few friends at Sluys, the most distressed company of creatures, as Comines affirms, that was ever seen. For Edward had pawned his military cloak, lined with marten fur, to pay the master of his ship, and was put on shore in his waistcoat. The Lord of Grothus received him, and fed and clothed him. This Fleming had previously performed a mighty service for Edward, when, as ambassador from Philip of Burgundy, he had visited Scotland, and broken the contract between the daughter of the Scots Queen Regent, and the son of Margaret of Anjou. Finally, Grothus lent Edward the Fourth money and ships, without which he would never have been restored to his country and queen. After his restoration, Edward invited his benefactor to England, in order to testify his gratitude, and introduce him to his queen. A journal, written either by this nobleman or his secretary, has been lately brought to light, containing the following curious passages. When the Lord of Grothus came to Windsor, my Lord Hastings received him, and led him to the far side of the quadrant, the quadrangle of Windsor Castle, to three chambers, where the king was then with the queen. These apartments were very richly hung with cloth of gold arras, and when he had spoken with the king, who presented him to the queen's grace, they then ordered the Lord Chamberlain Hastings to conduct him to his chamber, where supper was ready for him. After his refreshment, the king had brought him immediately to the queen's own withdrawing room, where she and her ladies were playing at the martu, and some of her ladies were playing at cloches of ivory, and some at divers other games, the which sight was full pleasant. Also King Edward danced with my lady Elizabeth, his eldest daughter. In the morning, when matins were done, the king heard in his own chapel, that is, of St. George, at Windsor Castle, Our Lady Mass, which was most melodiously sung. 
When the mass was done, King Edward gave his guest a cup of gold, garnished with pearl. In the midst of the cup was a great piece of unicorn's horn, to my estimation, seven inches in compass, and on the cover of the cup a great sapphire. Then the king came into the quadrant. My lord prince, also borne by his chamberlain, called Master Vaughn, bade the lord Grothus welcome. The innocent little prince was then only eighteen months old. Then the king took his guest into the little park, where they had great sport, and there the king made him ride on his own horse, a right fair hobby, the which the king gave him. The king's dinner was ordained, ordered, in the lodge in Windsor Park. After dinner, the king showed his guest his garden and vineyard of pleasure. Then the queen did ordain a great banquet in her own apartments, at which King Edward, her eldest daughter, the Duchess of Exeter, the Lady Rivers, and the Lord Grothus, all sat with her at one mess, and at another table sat the Duke of Buckingham, my lady his wife, my Lord Hastings, Chamberlain to the King, my Lord Berners, Chamberlain to the Queen, the son of Lord Grothus, and Master George Barth, Secretary to the Duke of Burgundy. There was a side table, at which sat a great view of ladies, all on one side of the room. Also on one side of the outer chamber sat the queen's gentlewoman, and when they had supped, my lady Elizabeth, the king's eldest daughter, danced with the Duke of Buckingham, her aunt's husband. It appears to have been the etiquette of this court, that this young princess, then but six years old, should only dance with her father or uncles. Then about nine o'clock, the king and the queen, with her ladies and gentlewomen, brought the lord of Grothus to three chambers of pleasance, all hung with white silk and linen cloth, and all the floors covered with carpets. There was ordained a bed for himself, of as good down as could be gotten. The sheets of wren's cloth, also fine festoons, the counterpane cloth of gold, furred with ermines. The tester and sealer, also shining cloth of gold, the curtains of white sarcent. As for his head suit and pillows, they were of the queen's own ordering. In the second chamber was likewise another state bed, all white. Also in the chamber was made a couch with feather beds, and hanged above like a tent, knit like a net, and there was a cupboard. In the third chamber was ordained a bane, bath, or two, which were covered with tents of white cloth. Could the present age offer a more luxurious or elegant arrangement in a suite of sleeping rooms than in those provided by Elizabeth for her husband's friend? And when the queen, with all her ladies, had shown him these rooms, the queen, with the king and attendants, turned again to their own chambers, and left the said Lord Grothus there with the Lord Chamberlain Hastings, which despoiled him, helped him undress, and they both went together to the bath. And when they had been in their baths, as long as was their pleasure, they had green ginger, divers syrups, confits, and hippocras, served by the order of the queen. And in the morning he took his cup with the king and queen, and returned to Westminster again. And on St. Edward's Day, 13th of October, King Edward kept his royal state at Westminster Palace. In the forenoon, he came into the Parliament in his robes, on his head a cap of maintenance, and sat in his most royal majesty, having before him his lords spiritual and temporal. Then the Speaker of the Common Parliament, named William Allington, declared before the king and his nobles the intent and desire of his commons, especially in their commendation of the womanly behavior and great constancy of his queen, when he was beyond the sea, also the great joy and surety of his land in the birth of the prince, and the great kindness and humanity of the Lord Grothus, then present, shown to the king when in Holland. Grothus was then, with all due ceremony, created Earl of Winchester. Ah, Cleve, the poet, reading aloud his letters patent. Then the king went into the white hall, whither came the queen crowned. Also the prince, in his robes of state, born after the queen, in the arms of his chamberlain, Master Vaughn. 
and thus the queen, the king, with the little prince carried after them, proceeded into the abbey church, and so up to the shrine of St. Edward, where they offered. Then the king turned down into the choir, where he sat in his throne. The new earl of Winchester bare his sword unto the time they went to dinner. As a finale to the entertainments, King Edward created a king at arms, baptizing him Guienne. Norroy was forced to proclaim the largest of the new Earl of Winchester, since Master Garter had an impediment in his tongue, a circumstance affording much mirth to the king. A void of light refreshments was then served to the king, and the Lord Grothus made his congé. The queen's visit to Oxford took place soon after. It was long remembered there. She arrived from Woodstock after sunset with the king, her mother, and the Duchess of Suffolk. They entered Oxford with a great crowd of people running before the royal chariots, bearing torches. The queen's brother, Mr. Lionel Woodville, the new chancellor, received and harangued the royal party, who tarried till after dinner the next day. King Edward viewed the new buildings of Magdalen, and made an oration in praise of Oxford, declaring he had sent his nephews, the sons of the Duchess of Suffolk, to be educated there as a proof of his esteem. The queen presided over the espousals of her second son, Richard, Duke of York, with Anne Mowbray, the infant heiress of the Duchy of Norfolk. St. Stephen's Chapel, where the ceremony was performed, January 1477, was splendidly hung with arras of gold on this occasion. The king, the young prince of Wales, the three princesses, Elizabeth, Mary, and Sicily, were present. The queen led the little bridegroom, who was not five, and her brother, Earl Rivers, led the baby bride, scarcely three years old. They afterwards all partook of a rich banquet, laid out in the painted chamber. The innocent and ill-fated infants, then married, verify the old English proverb, which says, Early wed, early dead. Soon after this infant marriage, all England was startled by the strange circumstances attending the death of the Duke of Clarence. Edward the Fourth, though deeply stained with crime, was, in the earlier periods of his life, susceptible of the tenderest feelings of natural affection and disinterested love. He had acted the part of a kind parent to his father's unprotected younger children. Clarence was not more than twelve years old at the Battle of Towton. It is therefore evident that he owed his high station wholly to the valiant arm of his elder brother. The best feelings of Edward were outraged by the unprovoked revolt of Clarence, nor did his return to allegiance, prompted as it was by the most sordid motives, raise him in his brother's esteem. Edward possessed, in an exaggerated degree, the revengeful spirit of the royal line of Plantagenet. He shall repent it through every vein of his heart, was his usual expression if any one crossed his will, and he too often kept his word. But if the misdeeds of a brother he had once so fondly loved were not likely to be forgiven by Edward, they were still less likely to be forgotten by the queen, who had been cruelly injured by Clarence. Her beloved father and her brother had been put to death in his name. Her brother Anthony, the pride of English chivalry, had narrowly escaped a similar fate, at a time when Clarence was a more active and responsible agent and her mother had been accused of sorcery by his party. Towards the spring of 1477, Clarence commenced a series of agitations, being exasperated because the queen opposed his endeavor to obtain the hand of Mary of Burgundy. Although so anxious for a wealthy marriage, his grief at the loss of his wife, Isabel of Warwick, had almost unsettled his reason, and he had illegally put one of her attendants to death, whom he accused of poisoning her. He muttered imputations of sorcery against the queen, in which he implicated King Edward. The queen was at Windsor with her royal lord, when news was brought him that his brother Clarence, after sitting at the council board for many days, doggedly silent, with folded arms, had one morning, 
rushed into the council room and uttered most disrespectful words against the queen and his royal person concerning the deaths of his friends burdett and stacy the comments of the queen did not soothe edward's mind who hurried to westminster and the arrest arraignment and sentence of the unhappy clarence soon followed he was condemned to death but the king demurred on his public execution clarence had since the death of his beloved isabel desperately given himself over to intemperance in order to drown the pain of thought in his dismal prison a butt of malmsey was introduced where he could have access to it the duke was found dead with his head hanging over the butt the night after he had offered his mass penny at the chapel within the tower probably clarence was the victim of his own frailty he was beset with temptation despair loneliness a vexed conscience a habit of drinking and a flowing butt of his favorite nectar at his elbow left little trouble either to assassins or executioners the partisans of the queen and the duke of gloucester mutually recriminated his death on each other gloucester was certainly absent from the scene of action residing in the north on the st george's day succeeding this grotesque but horrible tragedy the festival of the garter was celebrated with more than usual pomp and the queen took a decided part in it and wore the robes as chief lady of the order the queen kept up a correspondence by letter with the duchess of burgundy with the ambitious hope of obtaining the hand of mary of burgundy for her brother lord rivers when the duchess visited the court of england in august fourteen eighty the queen's youngest brother sir edward woodville was sent with a fleet to escort her the duchess sojourned at cold harbor the city residence which lately belonged to her deceased brother clarence among other gifts she was presented at her departure with a magnificent side saddle the queen's accomplished brother lord rivers continued his patronage to the infant art of printing in the archbishop of canterbury's library there is an illuminated manuscript representing earl rivers introducing his printer caxton and a book to king edward and queen elizabeth who were seated in state with their son the prince of wales standing between them the prince is very lovely with flowing curls the last years of king edward's life were passed in repose and luxury which had most fatal effects on his health he had long given the queen's place in his affections to his lovely mistress jane shore a goldsmith's wife in the city whom he had seduced from her duty the death of edward the fourth is said to have been hurried by the pain of mind he felt at the conduct of louis the eleventh who broke the engagement he had made to marry the dauphin to the princess elizabeth of york but intermittent fever was the immediate cause of his death when expiring he made his favorites stanley and hastings vow reconciliation with the queen and her family and propped with pillows the dying monarch exhorted them to protect his young sons he died with great professions of penitence if the king left any directions for the government of his kingdom during his son's minority they were not acted upon for no will of his is extant but one made at the time of his invasion of france fourteen seventy five accepting the control of his daughter's marriages this document gave no authority to the queen though it secures to her with many affectionate expressions all the furniture jewels and other movables she had used at various palaces and the possession of her dower which was unfortunately for her appropriated to her from the confiscated possessions of lancaster edward expired at westminster april ninth fourteen eighty three on the day of his death his body with the face arms and breast uncovered were laid out on a board for nine hours and all the nobility the lord mayor and aldermen of london sent for to recognize it and testify that he was really dead afterwards he was robed and clad royally and the whole psalter was said over the body and it was watched by bannerets and knights in long black gowns and hoods at the mass of requiem the queen's chamberlain lord dacre offered for her her son the marquis of dorset and lord hastings bore distinguished parts at the funeral
but the Earl of Lincoln, son of the Duchess of Suffolk, Edward the Fourth's sister, attended as chief mourner at his uncle's burial. The royal corpse was finally taken by water to Windsor, and interred with great pomp, in the beautiful chapel of St. George. Skelton, the unworthy laureate of Henry the Seventh and Henry the Eighth, has made Edward the Fourth the subject of a poem, which probably first brought him into notice at the court of Elizabeth of York, daughter of the deceased monarch. I made the tower strong, I wist not why, knew not for whom, I purchased Tattersall, I strengthened Dover on the mountain high, and London I convoked to fortify her wall. I made Nottingham a palace royal, Windsor, Eltham, and many mo. Yet at the last I went from them all, et ecce nuc in pluveri dormio. Where is now my conquest and royal array? Where be my coursers and my horses high? Where is my mirth, my solace, and my play? As vanity is not, all is wandered away. Then addressing his widowed queen, by the familiar epithet, which tradition says he was accustomed to call her, Edward is supposed to say, O oh, Lady Bessie, long for me ye may call, for I am departed until the doomsday, but love ye that Lord who is sovereign of all. Elizabeth was left, in reality, far more desolate and unprotected in her second than in her first widowhood. The young king was pursuing his studies at Ludlow Castle, and presiding over his principality of Wales, under the care of his accomplished uncle, Rivers, and under the guardianship of his faithful chamberlain, Vaughan, the same person who carried him in his arms, after the queen and his royal father, on all public occasions, when the little prince was a lovely babe of eighteen months. Elizabeth sat at the first council after the death of her husband, and proposed that the young king should be escorted to London with a powerful army. Fatally for himself and his royal master's children, jealousy of the Woodvilles prompted Hastings to contradict this prudent measure. He asked her insolently, against whom the young sovereign was to be defended? Who were his foes? Not his valiant uncle Gloucester, not Stanley or himself. Was not this proposed force rather destined to confirm the power of her kindred, and enable them to violate the oaths of amity they had so lately sworn by the deathbed of their royal master? He finished by vowing that he would retire from court if the young king was brought to London surrounded by soldiers. Thus taunted, the hapless Elizabeth gave up, with tears, the precautionary measures her maternal instinct had dictated, the necessity for which not a soul in that infatuated council foreboded but herself, and even she was not aware of her real enemy. The turbulent and powerful aristocracy, at the head of whom was Hastings, and who had ever opposed her family, were the persons she evidently dreaded. The Duke of Gloucester had been very little at court since the Restoration, and never yet had entered into angry collision with the Woodvilles. He was now absent at his government of the Scottish borders. When he heard of the death of the king, he immediately caused Edward V to be proclaimed at York, and wrote a letter of condolence to the queen, so full of deference, kindness, and submission, that Elizabeth thought she should have a most complying friend in the first prince of the blood. The council commanded Earl Rivers to bring up the young king, unattended by the militia of the Welsh border. Those hardy soldiers, who had more than once turned the scales of conquest in favor of York, and, if they had now been headed by the gallant rivers, they would have ensured the safety of Edward V. The astounding tidings that the Duke of Gloucester, abated by the Duke of Buckingham, had intercepted the young king, with an armed force, on his progress to London, had seized his person and arrested Earl Rivers and Lord Richard Grey, on the 29th of April, were brought to the Queen, at midnight, on the 3rd of May. Elizabeth then bitterly bewailed the time that she was persuaded from calling out the militia. In that moment of agony, she, however, remembered that while she could keep her second son in safety, the life of the young king was secure. Therefore, says Hall, 
she took her young son the duke of york and her daughters and went out of the palace of westminster into the sanctuary and there lodged in the abbot's place and she and all of her children and company were registered as sanctuary persons dorset the queen's eldest son directly he heard of the arrest of his brother weakly forsook his important trust as constable of the tower and came into sanctuary to his mother before day broke the lord chancellor then the archbishop of rotherham who lived in york palace beside westminster abbey having received the news of the duke of gloucester's proceedings called up his servants and took with him the great seal and went to the queen about whom he found much heaviness rumble haste and business with her conveyance of her household stuff into sanctuary every man was busy to carry bear and convey household stuffs chests and fardels packages no man was unoccupied and some walked off with more than they were directed to other places the queen sat alone below on the rushes in a state of desolation another chronicler adds to this picturesque description that her long fair hair so renowned for its beauty escaped from its confinement and streaming over her person swept on the ground a strange contrast with the rigid etiquette of royal widow's costume which commanded not only that such profusion of glittering tresses should be hid under hood and veil but that even the queen's forehead should be covered with a white frontlet and her chin to the upper lip with a piece of lawn called a barb the faithful archbishop acquainted the sorrowing queen with a cheering message sent him by lord hastings in the night ah woe worth him replied elizabeth for it is he that goeth about to destroy me and my blood madam said the archbishop be of good comfort i assure you if they crown any other king than your eldest son whom they have with them we will on the morrow crown his brother whom we have here with you and here is the great seal which in likewise as your noble husband gave it to me so i deliver it to you for the use of your son and therewith he delivered to the queen the great seal and departed from her in the dawning of day and when he opened his window and looked forth on the thames he saw the river covered with boats full of the duke of gloucester's servants watching that no one might go to the queen's asylum sir thomas more and he ought to be a good authority for anything relating to the chancellor's seals affirms that the archbishop alarmed at the step he had taken went afterwards to elizabeth then in sanctuary and persuaded her to return the great seal but gloucester never forgave him for its original surrender the apartments of the abbot of westminster are nearly in the same state at the present hour as when they received elizabeth and her train of young princesses the noble stone hall now used as a dining room for the students of westminster school was doubtless the place where elizabeth seated herself in her despair a low on the rushes all desolate and dismayed still may be seen the circular hearth in the midst of the hall and the remains of a louver in the roof at which such portions of smoke as chose to leave the room departed but the merry month of may was entered when elizabeth took refuge there and round about the hearth were arranged branches and flowers while the stone floor was strewn with green rushes at the end of the hall is oak panelling lattice at top with doors leading by winding stone stairs to the most curious nest of little rooms that the eye of antiquary ever looked upon these were and still are the private apartments of the dignitaries of the abbey while all offices of buttery kitchen and laundry are performed under many a quaint gothic arch in some places even at present rich with antique corbel and foliage this range so interesting as a specimen of the domestic usages of the middle ages terminates in the abbot's own sanctum or sitting room which still looks down on his lovely quiet flower garden nor must the passage be forgotten leading from this room to the corridor furnished with lattices now remaining where the abbot might unseen be witness of the conduct of his monks in the great hall below communicating with these are the state apartments of the royal abbey larger in dimensions and more costly in ornament richly dight with painted glass and fluted oak panelling 
Among these may be especially noted one called the organ room, likewise the antechamber to the great Jerusalem chamber, which last was the abbot's state reception room, and retains to this day, with its gothic window of painted glass, of exquisite workmanship, a curious tapestry, and fine original oil portrait of Richard the Second. Such are the principal features of the dwelling, whose monastic seclusion was once broken by the mournful plaints of the widowed queen, or echoed to the still more unwanted sounds of infant voices. For, with the exception of the two beautiful and womanly maidens, Elizabeth and Cicely, the royal family were young children. The queen took with her into sanctuary Elizabeth, seventeen years old at this time, afterwards married to Henry the Seventh. The next princess, Mary, had died at Greenwich, a twelve-month before this calamitous period. Cicely, whom Hall calls less fortunate than fair, was in her fifteenth year. She afterwards married Lord Wells. These three princesses had been the companions of their mother in 1470, when she had formerly sought sanctuary. Richard, Duke of York, born at Shrewsbury in 1472, was at this time eleven years old. Anne, born in 1474, after the date of her father's will, in which only the eldest daughters were named, was about eight years old. Catherine, born at Eltham, about August 1479, then between three and four years old. She afterwards married the heir of Devonshire. Bridget, born at Eltham, 1480, November 20th, then only in her third year. She was devoted to the convent from her birth, and was afterwards professed a nun at Dartford. End of section 19. Section 20 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 3, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anne Boulay. Elizabeth Woodville, Chapter 2, Part 2. The Queen had, in council, appointed May 4th for her son's coronation. His false uncle, however, did not bring him to London till that day. Edward V had entered the city, surrounded by officers of the Duke of Gloucester's retinue, who were all in deep mourning for the death of the late monarch. At the head of this posse rode Gloucester himself, habited in black, with his cap in his hand, oft-times bowing low, and pointing out his nephew, who wore the royal mantle of purple velvet, to the homage of the citizens. Edward V was at first lodged at the Bishop of Eli's palace, but as the good bishop, in common with all the high clergy, was faithful to the heirs of Edward IV, the young king was soon transferred to the regal apartments in the tower, under pretense of awaiting his coronation. Gloucester's next object was to get possession of Prince Richard, then safe with the queen. After a long and stormy debate, between the ecclesiastical peers and the temporal peers, at a council held in the star chamber, close to Elizabeth's retreat. It was decided that there might be sanctuary men and women, but as children could commit no crime for which an asylum was needed, the privileges of sanctuary could not be extended to them. Therefore the Duke of Gloucester, who was now recognized as Lord Protector, could possess himself of his nephew by force, if he pleased. The Archbishop of Canterbury was unwilling that force should be used, and he went, with the deputation of the temporal peers, to persuade Elizabeth to surrender her son. When they arrived at the Jerusalem chamber, the Archbishop urged that the young king required the company of his brother, being melancholy without a playfellow. To this Elizabeth replied, Troweth the protector, ah, pray God he may prove a protector, that the king doth lack a playfellow? Can none be found to play with the king but only his brother, which hath no wish to play because of sickness? As though princes, as young as they be, could not play without their peers, or children could not play without their kindred, with whom, for the most part, they agree worse than with strangers. At last she said, My lord, and all my lords now present, I will not be so suspicious as to mistrust your truths. 
Then, taking young Richard by the hand, she continued, Lo, here is this gentleman, whom I doubt not would be safely kept by me, if I were permitted. And well do I know, there be some such deadly enemies to my blood, that, if they wist where any lay in their own bodies, they would let it out if they could. The desire of a kingdom knoweth no kindred, brothers have been brothers' bane, and may the nephews be sure of the uncle? Each of these children are safe while they be asunder. Notwithstanding, I here deliver him, and his brother's life with him, into your hands, and of you I shall require them before God and man. Faithful be ye, I wot well, and power ye have, if ye list, to keep them safe. But if ye think I fear too much, yet beware ye fear not too little. And therewithal, continued she to the child, Farewell, mine own sweet son, God send you good keeping. Let me kiss you once ere you go, for God knoweth when we shall kiss together again. And therewith she kissed and blessed him, and turned her back, and wept, leaving the poor innocent child weeping as fast as herself. When the archbishop and the deputation of lords had received the young duke, they brought him into the star chamber, where the lord protector took him in his arms with these words. Now welcome, my lord, with all my very heart. He then brought him to the bishop's palace at St. Paul's, and from thence, honorably through the city, to the young king at the tower, out of which they were never seen abroad. Meantime, preparations went on, night and day, in the abbey and the vicinity, for the coronation of Edward V. Even the viands for the banquet were bought, which Hall declares were afterwards spoilt and thrown away. On the 13th of June, Richard of Gloucester called a council at the tower, ostensibly to fix the precise time of the coronation, but in reality to ascertain which of the lords were in earnest to have young Edward for their king. The first attack on Elizabeth took place at this council table, when Gloucester, after finding Hasty's incorruptible in his fealty to the heirs of Edward IV, broke out into a strain of invective against him, as leagued with that, which Dame Grey called his brother's wife, who, in conjunction with Jane Shore, had by their sorceries withered his arm. He showed his arm, which all present well knew had been long in that state. Hastings, being about to deny any alliance with the queen, or the powers of darkness, was rudely interrupted, dragged forth to the tower yard, and beheaded, without trial, before Gloucester's dinner was served. The same morning, Hastings had exulted much, on hearing the news that Lord Richard Grey, the queen's son, and Earl Rivers, her brother, whom he especially hated, had been put to death at Pontefract. From that moment, Elizabeth found her worst anticipations more than realized. The next blow was the attempt made at St. Paul's Cross by Dr. Shaw to prove her marriage invalid and her children illegitimate. This man, however, overshot his mark by attacking Cicely of York, Richard's mother. He repeated the scandals her son Clarence had cast upon her name and reaped no fruits but disgrace for his blundering malice. Soon afterwards, the faction of the Duke of Gloucester presented a petition to prevent the crown from falling to the issue of the pretended marriage between King Edward and Elizabeth Grey, made without the assent of the lords of the land, and by the sorcery of the said Elizabeth and her mother Jaquetta, as the public voice is through the land, privily and secretly, in a chamber, without proclamation by bands, according to the laudable custom of the Church of England the said King Edward being married and troth plight a long time before, to one Eleanor Butler, daughter to the old Earl of Shrewsbury. A forced recognition of Richard as king, in the hall of Crosby House, his town residence, followed the presentation of this petition, and from that day, June 26th, the son of Elizabeth was considered deposed. The coronation of Richard III took place ten days after. Among the gloomy range of fortresses belonging to the tower, tradition has pointed out the Porculus Tower as the scene of the murder of the young princes. The royal children were probably removed to this building when their uncle came to take possession of the regal apartments in the tower on the 4th of July. Forthwith, the two young princes were both shut up, 
and all their people removed, but only one, called Black Will, or Will Slaughter, who was set to serve them, and four keepers to guard them. The young king was heard to say, sighingly, I would mine uncle would let me have my life, though he taketh my crown. After which time the prince never tied his points, nor anything attended to himself, but with that young babe, his brother, lingered in thought and heaviness till the traitorous deed delivered them from wretchedness. During Richard's progress to the north, he roused Sir James Tyrrell from his pallet bed in his guard chamber one night at Warwick, and sent him to destroy the royal children. Sir Robert Brackenbury refused to cooperate, but gave up the keys of the tower for one night to the usurper's emissary. Then Sir James Tyrrell devised that the princes should be murdered in bed, to the execution whereof he appropriated Miles Forrest, one of their keepers, a fellow flesh bred in murder. And to him he joined one John Dighton, his own horse keeper, a big broad square knave. All their other attendants being removed from them, and the harmless children in bed, these men came into their chamber, and suddenly lapping them in the clothes, smothered and stifled them till thoroughly dead. Then laying out their bodies in the bed, they fetched Sir James to see them, who caused the murderers to bury them at the stair foot, deep in the ground, under a heap of stones. Then rode Sir James in great haste to King Richard, and showed him the manner of the murder, who gave him great thanks, but allowed not their burial in so vile a corner, but would have them buried in consecrated ground. Sir Robert Brackenbury's priest then took them up, and where he buried them was never known, for he died directly afterwards. But when, continues Sir Thomas More, the news was first brought to the unfortunate mother, yet being in sanctuary, that her two sons were murdered, it struck to her heart like the sharp dart of death. She was so suddenly amazed that she swooned and fell to the ground, and there lay in great agony, like a dead corpse. And after she was revived and came to her memory again, she wept and sobbed, and with pitiful screeches filled the whole mansion. Her breast she beat, her fair hair she teared and pulled in pieces, and calling by name her sweet babes, accounted herself mad when she delivered her younger son out of sanctuary, for his uncle to put him to death. After long lamentation, she kneeled down and cried to God to take vengeance. Who, she said, she never doubted would remember it. And when in a few months Richard unexpectedly lost his only son, the child for whose advancement he had steeped his soul in crime, Englishmen declared that the imprecation of the agonized mother had been heard. The wretched queen's health sank under the load of intense anguish, inflicted by these murders, which had been preceded by the illegal execution of her son, Lord Richard Grey, and of her noble-minded brother at Pontefract. She was visited in sanctuary by a priest physician, Dr. Lewis, who likewise attended Margaret Beaufort, mother to Henry Tudor, Earl of Richmond, then in exile in Bretagne. The plan of uniting the Princess Elizabeth with this last scion of the House of Lancaster was first suggested to the desolate queen by Dr. Lewis. She eagerly embraced the proposition, and the good physician becoming, by means of daily visits, the medium of negotiation between the two mothers, the queen finally agreed to recognize Henry Tudor as king of England, if he were able to dispossess the usurper, and obtain the hand of her daughter. Buckingham, having been disgusted by Richard, his partner in crime, rose in arms. The queen's son, Dorset, had escaped out of sanctuary by the agency of his friend Lovell, one of the tyrant's ministers, raised an insurrection in Yorkshire, with the queen's valiant brother, Sir Edward Woodville, but, on Buckingham's defeat, fled to Paris, where he continued the treaty for the marriage of his half-sister, the Princess Royal, and Henry Tudor. After the utter failure of Buckingham's insurrection, Elizabeth was reduced to despair, and finally was forced to leave sanctuary, and surrender herself and daughters into the hands of the usurper, March 1484. For this step she was blamed severely, by those who have not taken a clear and close view of the difficulties of her situation. She had probably, in the course of ten months, exhausted her own means, and tried the hospitality of the monks at Westminster. 
Moreover, though the king could not lawfully infringe the liberty of sanctuary, he could cut off supplies of food and starve out the inmates, and he kept a guard of soldiers round the abbey, commanded by John Nesfield, who watched all comers and goers. Elizabeth, however, would not leave her retreat without exacting a solemn oath, guaranteeing the safety of her children from Richard, which the usurper took in the presence of the Lord Mayor and Aldermen, as well as the Lords of the Council. The terms of Elizabeth's surrender are peculiarly bitter, for it is evident that she and her daughters not only descended into the rank of mere private gentlewomen, but she herself was held in personal restraint, since the annuity of seven hundred marks, allotted by Act of Parliament for her subsistence, was to be paid, not to her, but to John Nesfield, squire of the body of King Richard, for the finding, exhibition, and attendance of Dame Elizabeth Grey, late calling herself Queen of England. Thus Elizabeth had not a servant she could call her own, for this myrmidian of King Richard's was to find her, not only with food and clothes, but attendance. After leaving sanctuary, some obscure apartments in the palace of Westminster are supposed to have been the place of her abode. From thence she wrote to her son Dorset at Paris, to put an end immediately to the treaty of marriage between the Earl of Richmond and the Princess Elizabeth, and to return to her. The parties who had projected the marriage were struck with consternation, and greatly incensed at the Queen's conduct, but these steps were the evident result of the personal restraint she was then enduring. If Richard III chose to court her daughter as his wife, Queen Elizabeth ought to be acquitted of blame, for it is evident that if she had been as yielding in the matter as commonly supposed, she would not have been under the control of John Nesfield. The successful termination of the expedition undertaken by the Earl of Richmond to obtain his promised bride and the crown of England at once avenged the widow queen and her family on the usurper and restored her to liberty. Instead of being under the despotic control of the royal hunchback's man at arms, the queen made joyful preparation to receive her eldest daughter, who was brought to her at Westminster from Sheriff Hutton, with honor, attended by a great company of noble ladies. Queen Elizabeth had the care of her daughter till the January following the Battle of Bosworth, when she saw her united in marriage to Henry of Richmond, the acknowledged king of England. One of Henry the Seventh's first acts was to invest the mother of his queen with the privileges and state befitting her rank as the widow of an English sovereign. She had never been recognized as queen dowager, excepting in the few wrangling privy councils that intervened between the death of her husband and her retreat into the Abbey of Westminster, and even during these, her advice had been disregarded and her orders defied. Therefore, to Henry the Seventh her son-in-law, she owed the first regular recognition of her rights as widow of an English sovereign. Unfortunately, Elizabeth had not been dowered on lands anciently appropriated to the queens of England, but on those of the Duchy of Lancaster, which Henry the Seventh claimed as heir of John of Gaunt. However, a month after the marriage of her daughter to Henry the Seventh, the queen dowager received possession of some of the dower palaces, among which Waltham, Farnham, Mashabury, and Bado may be noted. Henry likewise adds a pension of a hundred and two pounds per annum from his revenues. The scandalous entries on the parliamentary rolls, whereby she was deprived of her dower in the preceding reign, were ordered by the judges to be burnt, their first lines only being read, because from their falseness and shamefulness they were only deserving of utter oblivion. Although so much has been said in history regarding Henry the Seventh's persecution of his mother-in-law, this, the only public act passed regarding her, which appears on the rolls, is marked with delicacy and respect. If she were deprived of her rights and property once more, no evidence exists of the fact, excepting mere assertion. Nor are assertions, even of contemporaries, to be credited without confirmatory documents, at any era, when a country was divided into factions, furious as those which kept the reign of Henry the Seventh in continual ferment. 
it is possible that henry the seventh personally disliked his mother-in-law and in this he was by no means singular for there never was a woman who contrived to make more personal enemies but that he ever deprived her of either property or dignity remains yet to be proved this queen had passed through a series of calamities sufficient to wean the most frivolous person from pleasure and pageantry she had to mourn the untimely deaths of three murdered sons and she had four daughters wholly destitute and dependent on her for their support it can therefore scarcely be matter of surprise that in the decline of life she seldom shared in the gaieties of her daughter's court nevertheless she appeared there frequently enough to invalidate the oft-repeated assertions that she fell into disgrace with the king for encouraging the rebellions of the earl of lincoln and lambert simnel was such conduct possible the earl of lincoln had been proclaimed heir to the throne by richard the third and as such was the supplanter of all her children and lambert simnel represented a youth who was the son of clarence her enemy and the grandson of the mighty earl of warwick the sworn foe of all the house of woodville however at the very time she is declared to be in disgrace for such unnatural partiality she was chosen by the king in preference to his own beloved mother as sponsor to his dearly prized heir prince arthur on september twentieth fourteen eighty six elizabeth of york gave birth to an heir and on sunday following her mother the queen dowager stood godmother to him in westminster cathedral after describing the procession in which the princess sicily carried the infant the historian adds queen elizabeth was in the cathedral abiding the coming of the prince she gave a rich cup of gold covered which was borne by sir davy owen the earl of derby gave a gold salt and the Lord Maltravers gave a coffer of gold, these standing with the queen as sponsors. Soon afterwards, Henry the Seventh sought to strengthen his interest in Scotland by negotiating a marriage between James the Third and his mother-in-law, a husband certainly young enough to be her son. Yet his violent death alone prevented her from wearing the crown matrimonial of Scotland, when she would have been placed in a situation to injure her son-in-law if such had been her wish. The last time the Queen Dowager appeared in public was in a situation of the highest dignity. The Queen Consort had taken to her chamber, previously to her accouchement, in the close of the year 1489, when her mother, Elizabeth Woodville, received the French ambassador in great state, assisted by Margaret, the King's mother. The next year, Henry the Seventh presented his mother-in-law with an annuity of 400 pounds, no surrender of lands of equal value has yet been discovered yet strange to say historians declare she was stripped of everything because about this time she retired into the convent of bermondsey here she had every right to be not as a prisoner but as a cherished and highly honored inmate for the prior and monks of bermondsey were solemnly bound by the deeds of their charter to find hospitality for the representatives of their great founder clare earl of gloucester in the state rooms of the convent now edward the fourth was heir to the clares and elizabeth queen dowager had every right as his widow to appropriate the apartments expressly reserved for the use of the founder she had a right of property there and as it was the custom in the middle ages for royal persons to seek monastic seclusion when health declined not only for devotional purposes but for medical advice where could elizabeth better retire than to a convent bound by its charter to receive her eighteen months after she was seized with a fatal illness at bermondsey and on her deathbed dictated the following will in the name of god etc tenth april fourteen ninety two I, Elizabeth, by the grace of God, Queen of England, late wife to the most victorious prince of blessed memory, Edward the Fourth. Item, I bequeath my body to be buried with the body of my lord at Windsor, without pompous interring or costly expenses done thereabout. Item, whereas I have no worldly goods to do the queen's grace, my dearest daughter, a pleasure with, neither to reward any of my children, according to my heart and mind, 
I beseech God Almighty to bless her grace with all her noble issue, and with as good a heart and mind as may be, I give her grace my blessing, and all the aforesaid my children. Item. I will that such small stuff and goods that I have be disposed truly in the contentation of my debts, and for the health of my soul, as far as they will extend. Item. That if any of my blood will wish to have any of my said stuff, to me pertaining, I will they have the preferment before all others, and of this my present testament I make and ordain my executors, that is to say, John Ingleby, prior of the Charter House of Sheen, William Sutton and Thomas Brent, doctors. And I beseech my said dearest daughter, the Queen's Grace, and my son Thomas, Marquis of Dorset, to put their good wills and help, for the performance of this my testament. In witness whereof to this my testament, these witnesses, John, abbot of Bermondsey, and Benedict Coon, doctor of physic, given the year and day aforesaid. The daughter of Elizabeth attended her deathbed, and paid her affectionate attention. The queen alone was prevented, having taken to her chamber, preparatory to the birth of the princess Margaret. Elizabeth died the Friday before Whitsuntide, and as she expressed an earnest wish for speedy and private burial, her funeral took place on Whit Sunday, 1492. Her will shows that she died destitute of personal property, but that is no proof of previous persecution, since several of our queens, who were possessed of the undivided dower appanage, and whose children were provided for, died not much richer. Indeed, it was not easy, that era, for persons, who had only a life income, to invest their savings securely, therefore they seldom made any. Elizabeth had four daughters wholly dependent on her for support, since the calamities of the times had left them dowerless, and, after the death of their mother, the queen, their sister, was much impoverished by their maintenance. The great possessions of the House of York were chiefly in the grasp of the old avaricious duchess, Sicily of York, who survived her hated daughter-in-law several years. Edward the Fourth had endowed his proud mother as if she were a queen dowager, while his wife was dowered on property to which he possessed no real title. Some discontented Yorkists, who witnessed the parsonomious funeral of Elizabeth, has described it, and preserved the interesting fact, that the only lady who accompanied the corpse of the queen, on its passage from the river to Windsor Castle, was one Mistress Grace, a natural daughter of Edward the Fourth. On Whit's Sunday, the Queen Dowager's corpse was conveyed by water to Windsor, and there privily, through the little park, conducted unto the castle, without any ringing of bells or receiving of the dean, but only accompanied by the prior of the Charter House, and Dr. Brent, Mr. Hout, and Mistress Grey, a bastard daughter of King Edward the Fourth, and no other gentlewoman, and, as it was told to me, the priest of the college received her in the castle, Windsor, and so privily, about eleven of the clock, she was buried, without any solemn dirge done for her obit. On the morn thither came Audley, Bishop of Rochester, to do the office, but that day nothing was done solemnly for her saving. Also a hearse, such as they use for the common people, with wooden candlesticks about it, and a black pall of cloth of gold on it, four candlesticks of silver gilt, every one having a taper of no great weight. On the Tuesday hither came, by water, King Edward's three daughters, the Lady Anne, the Lady Catherine, and the Lady Bridget, the nun princess, from Dartford, accompanied by the Marchioness of Dorset, the daughter of the Duke of Buckingham, the Queen's niece, the daughter of the Marquis of Dorset, Lady Herbert, also niece to the Queen, Dame Catherine Grey, Dame Guilford, governess to the children of Elizabeth of York, their gentlewomen walked behind the three daughters of the dead. Also that Tuesday came the Marquis of Dorset, son to the Queen, the Earl of Essex, her brother-in-law, and the Viscount Wells, her son-in-law. And that night began the dirge. But neither at the dirge were the twelve poor men clad in black, but a dozen divers old men. That is, old men dressed in the many-colored garments of poverty. And they held old torches and torches' ends. And the next morning on the cannons, 
called Master Vaughn, sang Our Lady Mass, at the which the Lord Dorset offered a piece of gold. He kneeled at the hearse head. The ladies came not to the Mass of Requiem, and the Lord sat about in the choir. My Lady Anne came to offer the Mass penny, and her officers at arms went before her. She offered the penny at the head of the Queen, wherefore she had the carpet and the cushion. And the Viscount Wells took his wife's offering, and Dame Catherine Grey bare the Lady Anne's train. Every one of the king's daughters offered. The Marquis of Dorset offered a piece of gold, and all the lords at their pleasure. The poor knights of Windsor, Dean, Canons, Yeomen, and officers at arms, all offered, and after Mass, the Lord Marquis paid the cost of the funeral. At the east end of St. George's Chapel, North Isle, is the tomb of Edward the Fourth being a monument of steel, representing a pair of gates between two towers, of ancient Gothic architecture. On a flat stone at the foot of this monument are engraven, in Old English characters, the words, King Edward and his Queen, Elizabeth Woodville. In 1810, when the place of sepulchre for the family of George III was in course of preparation at the east end of St. George's Chapel, an excavation was formed in the solid bed of chalk of the full size of the edifice above, when two stone coffins containing the bodies of Queen Elizabeth Woodville and her son Prince George were discovered, fifteen feet below the surface, thus realizing the emphatic words of Southey. Thou, Elizabeth, art here, thou to whom all griefs are known, who wert placed upon the bier in happier hour than on a throne. End of section 20. Section 21 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 3, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anne Boulay. Anne of Warwick. Anne of Warwick, the last of our Plantagenet queens, and the first who had previously borne the title of Princess of Wales, was born at Warwick Castle in the year 1454. On each side of the faded, melancholy portrait of this unfortunate lady, in the pictorial history of her maternal ancestry, called the Rue Roll, two mysterious hands are introduced, offering to her the rival crowns of York and Lancaster, while the white bear, the cognizance assumed by her mighty sire, Warwick the Kingmaker, lies muzzled at her feet, as if the royal lions of Plantagenet had quelled the pride of that hitherto blameless bear on the blood-stained heath of Barnet. The principal events which marked the career of her father have been traced in the memoirs of the two preceding queens. Richard Neville, surnamed the king-making Earl of Warwick, was heir, in right of the countess his mother, to the vast inheritance of the Montagues, earls of Salisbury. He aggrandized himself in a higher degree by his union, in 1448, with Anne, the sister of Beauchamp, Earl of Warwick, who had become sole heiress of that mighty line, by the early death of her niece the preceding year. Richard was soon after summoned to the House of Lords, in right of his wife, as Earl of Warwick. He possessed an income of 22,000 marks per annum, but had no male heir, his family consisting but of two daughters. The eldest, Lady Isabel, was very handsome. Buck calls Lady Anne the better woman of the two, but he gives no reason for the epithet. When, on the convalescence of King Henry, Margaret of Anjou recovered her former influence in the government, Warwick, having good reason to dread her vengeance, withdrew, with his countess and young daughters, to his government of Calais, where much of the childhood and early youth of the Lady Anne were spent. Occasionally, indeed, when the star of York was in the ascendant, Warwick brought the ladies of his family either to his feudal castle or his residence in Warwick Lane. The site of this mansion is still known by the name of Warwick Court. Here the Earl exercised semi-barbarous hospitality. In the year 1458, when a pacification was attempted between the warring houses of York and Lancaster, 600 of the retainers of Anne's father were quartered in Warwick Lane, all dressed alike in red jackets, with the bear and ragged staff, embroidered both before and behind. 
At Warwick House, six oxen were daily devoured for breakfast, and all the taverns about St. Paul's and Newgate Street were full of Warwick's meat, for anyone who could claim acquaintance with the Earl's red-jacketed gentry might resort to his flesh-pots, and, sticking his dagger therein, carry off as much beef as could be taken on a long dagger. At this period, the closest connection subsisted between the families of the Duke of York and the Earl of Warwick, Richard Plantagenet, afterwards Richard III, was two years older than the Lady Anne. He was born October 2nd, 1452, at his father's princely castle of Fotheringay. He was the youngest son of Richard, Duke of York, and his Duchess Sicily, the Earl of Warwick's aunt. At his nativity, says Rue, a contemporary chronicler, the scorpion was in the ascendant. He came into the world with teeth, and with a head of hair reaching to his shoulders. He was small of stature, with a short face, and unequal shoulders, the right being higher than the left. Passing over events already related, that led to the deposition of Henry the Sixth. positive proof may be found that Anne of Warwick and Richard of Gloucester were companions, when he was about fourteen and she was twelve years old. After Richard had been created Duke of Gloucester, at his brother's coronation, it is highly probable he was consigned to the guardianship of the Earl of Warwick at Middleham Castle, for, at the grand enthronization of George Neville, the uncle of Anne, as Archbishop of York, Richard was a guest at York Palace, seated in the place of honor, in the chief banqueting room, upon the dais, under a cloth of estate or canopy, with the Duchess of Westmoreland on his left hand, his sister, the Duchess of Suffolk, on his right, and the noble maidens, his cousins, the Lady Anne and the Lady Isabel, seated opposite to him. These ladies must have been placed there expressly to please the prince, by affording him companions of his own age, since the Countess of Warwick, their mother, sat at the second table, in a place much lower in dignity. Richard, being the son of Lady Anne's great-aunt, an intimacy naturally subsisted between such near relatives. Marjorie, a Flemish analyst, affirms that Richard had formed a very strong affection for his cousin Anne, but succeeding events proved that the lady did not bestow the same regard on him which her sister Isabel did on his brother Clarence, nor was it to be expected, considering his disagreeable person and temper. As Lady Anne did not smile on her crookback cousin, there was no inducement for him to forsake the cause of his brother, King Edward. It was in vain his brother Clarence said, in a conference with Warwick, By sweet St. George, I swear, that if my brother Gloucester would join me, I would make Edward know we were all one man's sons, which should be nearer to him than strangers of his wife's blood. Anne was, at this juncture, with her mother and sister at Calais, for, continues Hall, the Earl of Warwick and the Duke of Clarence sailed directly thither, where they were solemnly received and joyously entertained by the Countess of Warwick and her two daughters, and after the Duke had sworn on the sacrament, ever to keep part and promise with the Earl, he married Isabel in the Lady Church of Calais, in the presence of the Countess and her daughter Anne. The Earl of Warwick, accompanied by his Duchess and Lady Anne, returned with the newly wedded pair to England, where he and his son-in-law soon raised a civil war that shook the throne of Edward IV. After the loss of the Battle of Edgecote, the Earl of Warwick escaped with his family to Dartmouth, where they were taken on board a fleet of which he was master. On the voyage, they encountered the young Earl of Rivers with the Yorkist fleet, who gave their ships battle, and took all excepting the vessel containing the Neville family. While this ship was flying from the victorious enemy, a dreadful tempest arose, and the ladies on board were afflicted at once with terror of wreck, and the oppression of seasickness. To add to their troubles, the Duchess of Clarence was taken in labor with her first child. In the midst of this accumulation of disasters, the tempest-tossed bark made the offing of Calais, but in spite of the distress on board, Vauclair, whom Warwick had left as his lieutenant, held out the town against him, and would not permit the ladies to land. He, however, sent two flagons of wine on board, for the Duchess of Clarence, with a private message, assuring Warwick, that the refusal arose from the townspeople, and advising him to make some other port in France. 
The Duchess of Clarence soon after gave birth, on board ship, to the babe who had chosen so inappropriate a time for his entrance into a troublesome world, and the whole family landed safely at Dieppe, the beginning of May, 1470. When they were able to travel, the Lady Anne, her mother and sister, attended by Clarence and Warwick, journeyed across France to Amboise, where they were graciously received by Louis the Eleventh and that treaty was finally completed, which made Anne the wife of Edward, the gallant heir of Lancaster. This portion of the life of Anne of Warwick is so inextricably interwoven with that of her mother-in-law, Queen Margaret, that it were in vain to repeat it a second time. Suffice it to observe that the bride was in her seventeenth, and the bridegroom in his nineteenth year, and that Prevost affirms that the match was one of ardent love on both sides. The prince was well educated, refined in manners, and moreover, his portrait in the Rue Roll bears out the tradition that he was eminently handsome. The ill-fated pair remained in each other's company from their marriage at Angers in August 1470 till the fatal field of Tewkesbury, May 4th, 1471. Although the testimony of George Buck must be received with the utmost caution, yet he quotes a contemporary Flemish chronicler who affirms that, Anne was with her husband, Edward of Lancaster, when that unfortunate prince was hurried before Edward the Fourth after the Battle of Tewkesbury, and that it was observed, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, was the only person present who did not draw his sword on the royal captive, out of respect to the presence of Anne, as she was the near relative of his mother, and a person whose affections he had always desired to possess. English chroniclers, however, affirm that, at this very moment, Anne was with her unhappy mother-in-law, Queen Margaret. After Margaret was taken away to the Tower of London, Clarence privately abducted his sister-in-law, under the pretense of protecting her. As he was her sister's husband, he was exceedingly unwilling to divide the united inheritance of Warwick and Salisbury, which he knew must be done, if his brother Gloucester carried into execution his avowed intention of marrying Anne. But very different was the conduct of the young widow of the Prince of Wales from that described by Shakespeare. Instead of acting as chief mourner to the hearse of her husband's murdered father, she was sedulously concealing herself from her abhorred cousin, enduring every privation to avoid his notice, and concurring with all the schemes of her self-interested brother-in-law Clarence, so completely, as to descend from the rank of Princess of Wales, to the disguise of a servant, in a mean house in London, in the hopes of eluding the search of Gloucester. Incidents too romantic to be believed, without the testimony of a Latin chronicler of the highest authority, who affirms it in the following words. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, wished to discover Anne, the youngest daughter of the Earl of Warwick, in order to marry her. This was much disapproved by his brother, the Duke of Clarence, who did not wish to divide his wife's inheritance. He, therefore, hid the young lady. But the cunning of the Duke of Gloucester discovered her, in the disguise of a cookmaid in the city of London, and he immediately transferred her to the sanctuary of St. Martin's Le Grand. She needed this asylum, because she was under the attainer in which her hapless mother and Queen Margaret were included. The unfortunate widow of Prince Edward was, after this, removed to the protection of her uncle George, the Archbishop of York, and was even permitted to visit and comfort her mother-in-law, Queen Margaret, at the tower. But as she still resisted marrying Richard, she was deprived of her uncle's protection, her last refuge against her hated cousin. The unfortunate mother of Anne remained in the sanctuary she had first taken till the same year. A letter of Pastins, dated 1473, observes, that the Countess of Warwick is out of Beaulieu sanctuary, and that Sir James Tyrrell conveyeth her northwards, but the Duke of Clarence liketh it not. And on April 2nd, 1473, he notifies that, the world seemeth queasy, for all the persons about the king's person have sent for their armor, on account of the quarrel regarding the inheritance of Anne. The dispute was debated in council, and the king made an award, assigning certain lands to the Duke of Gloucester, and adjudging the rest of the estate to Clarence. 
This award was made at the expense of Anne, Countess of Warwick, the mother of the young ladies, and the true heiress of the vast estates of Dispenser and Beauchamp. The Act of Parliament specified that the Countess of Warwick was no more to be considered in the award of her inheritance than if she were dead. In fact, Rue accuses Richard of incarcerating, during his life, the venerable Countess Anna, the rightful mistress of the Warwick patrimony, when in her distress she fled to him as her son-in-law for protection, an ill deed which has not commonly been enumerated in the ample list of Richard's iniquities. The marriage of Lady Anne and Richard Duke of Gloucester took place at Westminster, 1473, probably a few days before the date of Paston's letter. Prevost affirms she was compelled by violence to marry Richard. Some illegalities were connected with this ceremony, assuredly arising from the reluctance of the bride, since the parliamentary rolls of the next year contain a curious act, empowering the Duke of Gloucester to continue the full possession and enjoyments of Anne's property, even if she were to divorce him, provided he did his best to be reconciled and remarried to her. Ominous clauses relating to a wedlock of a few months but which proved that Anne mediated availing herself of some informality of her abhorred marriage. But if she had done so, her husband would have remained in possession of her property. The informalities most likely arose from the want of the proper bulls to dispense with relationship, and as the free consent of both bride and bridegroom was an indispensable preliminary to such dispensation, the absence of these legal instruments negatively proved that the unfortunate Anne Neville never consented to her second marriage. The birth of her son Edward at Middleham Castle, 1474, probably reconciled the unhappy Duchess of Gloucester to her miserable fate, but that her marriage was never legalized may be guessed by the rumors of a subsequent period, when the venomous hunchback, her cousin husband, mediated in his turn divorcing her. Richard and Anne lived chiefly at Middleham Castle in Yorkshire, an abode convenient for the office borne by the Duke as governor of the Northern Marches. As a very active war was proceeding with Scotland, in the course of which Richard won several battles, and captured Edinburgh, his reluctant wife was not troubled much with his company, but devoted herself to her boy, in whom all her affections were centered, and the very springs of her life wound up in his welfare. During her abode at Middleham, she lost her sister, the Duchess of Clarence, who died December 12, 1476. The death of Edward IV caused a great change in the life of Anne. The Duke of Gloucester, who had very recently returned from Scotland, left Anne and his boy at Middleham, when he departed with a troop of horse, to intercept his young nephew, Edward V, on progress to London. Richard's household book at Middleham, affords some noticia regarding the son of Anne of Warwick during his father's absence. Geoffrey Frank is allowed twenty-two shillings nine pence for green cloth, and one shilling eight pence for making it into gowns for my Lord Prince and Mr. Neville, five shillings for choosing a King of West Witten in some frolic of rush bearing, and five shillings for a feather for my Lord Prince, and Durick, shoemaker, had thirteen shillings one pence for his shoes, and Jane Collins, his nurse, one hundred shillings for her year's wages. Among the expenses which seem to have occurred on the progress of the young prince up to London, on the occasion of the coronation of his parents, are his offerings at Fountains Abbey and other religious houses, for mending his whip, two pence, and six shillings eight pence to two of his men, Medcalf and Paycock, for running on foot by the side of his carriage. After a succession of astounding crimes, Richard effected the usurpation of his nephew's throne, and Anne of Warwick was placed in the situation of consort to an English monarch. She arrived in London with her son, in time to share her husband's coronation, yet we should think her arrival was just before that event, as her rich dress, for the occasion, was only bought two days preceding the ceremony. There is an order to Piers Curtis to deliver for the use of the queen four and a half yards of purpil cloth of gold upon Damask, July 3rd. Short time had the tire woman of Anna Warwick, 
to display their skill in the fitting of her regal robes, since this garment was to be worn on the fifth of the same month. Sunday, July 4th, Richard, who had previously been proclaimed king, conducted his queen and her son in great state, by water, from Baynard's castle to the tower, where his hapless little prisoners were made to vacate the royal apartments, and were consigned to a tower near the water gate, since called the Bloody Tower. The same day Anne's only child, Edward, was created Prince of Wales. The grand procession of the king and queen, and their young heir, through the city, took place on the morrow, when they were attended from the tower by four thousand northern partisans, whom the king and queen called gentlemen of the north, but who were regarded by the citizens as an ungentle and suspicious-looking pack of vagabonds. The next day, July 5th, the coronation of Richard and his queen took place, with an unusual display of pageantry, great part of which had been prepared for the coronation of the hapless Edward V. The following day, says Grafton, the king, with Queen Anne, his wife, came down out of the White Hall, into the Great Hall of Westminster, and went directly to the king's bench, where they sat some time, and from thence the king and queen walked barefoot upon striped cloth, unto King Edward's shrine, all their nobility going before them, every lord in his degree. The Duke of Norfolk bore the king's crown before him, between both his hands, and the Duke of Buckingham, with a white staff in his hand, bore the royal hunchback's train. Queen Anne had both earls and barons preceding her. The Earl of Huntingdon bore her scepter, Viscount Lyle, the rod with the dove, and the Earl of Wiltshire, her crown. Then came, continues a contemporary manuscript, our sovereign lady the queen, over her head a canopy, and at every corner a bell of gold, and on her head a circlet of gold, with many precious stones set therein, and on every side of the queen went a bishop, and my lady of Richmond bare the queen's train. So they went from St. Edward's shrine to the seats of state by the altar, and when the king and queen were seated, there came forth their highnesses priests and clerks, singing most delectably, Latin and prick song, full royally. This part of the ceremonial concluded, the king and queen came down from their seats of estate, and the king had great observance and service. Our authority states that the king and queen put off their robes and stood all naked from their waists upwards, till the bishop had anointed them. Their majesties afterwards assumed their robes of cloth of gold, and Cardinal Morton crowned them both with much solemnity. The priests and clerks sung Te Duum with great royalty. The homage was paid at that part of the mass called the offertory, during which time the queen sat with the bishops and peeresses, while Richard received the kiss of fealty from his peers. The bishop of Exeter and Norwich stood on each side of the queen. The countess of Richmond was on her left hand, and the duchess of Norfolk knelt behind the queen with the other ladies. Then the king and queen came down to the high altar and kneeled, and anon the cardinal turned him about with the holy sacrament in his hand, and parted it between them both, and thus they received the good lord. Their crowns were offered, as usual, at St. Edward's shrine. The king proceeded out of the abbey church, and the queen followed, bearing the scepter in her right hand, and the dove with the rod in her left, so going forth till they came to the high dais at Westminster Hall, and when they came there, they left their canopies standing, and retired to their chamber. Meantime, the Duke of Norfolk came riding into Westminster Hall, his horse trapped with cloth of gold down to the ground, and he voided it of all people but the king's servants. And the Duke of Buckingham called to the marshal, saying how the king would have his lord sit at four boards in the hall, and at four o'clock the king and queen came to the high dais. On the queen's right hand stood my lady Surrey, and on her left the lady Nottingham, holding a canopy of state over her head. The king sat at the middle of the table, the queen at the left hand of the table, and on each side of her stood a countess, holding a cloth of pleasance when she listed to drink. The champion of England after dinner rode into the hall, and made his challenge without being gainsaid. The Lord Mayor served the king and queen with Ippocras, wafers and sweet wine, and by that time it was dark night. Anon came into the hall, 
great lights of wax torches and torchettes, and as soon as the lights came up the hall, the lords and ladies went up to the king and made their obeisance. And anon, the king and queen rose up and went to their chambers, and every man and woman departed and went their ways, where it liked them best. After the coronation, Queen Anne went to Windsor Castle with the king and her son. Here Richard left her, while he undertook a devious progress, ending at Tewkesbury. The queen and prince then commenced a splendid progress, in which they were attended by many prelates and peers, and the Spanish ambassador, who had come to propose an alliance between the eldest daughter of his sovereigns, Ferdinand and Isabella, and the son of Richard the Third. The queen took up her abode at Warwick Castle, the place of her birth, and the grand feudal seat of her father, which belonged to the young Earl of Warwick, the son of her sister Isabel and the Duke of Clarence, and it is especially noted that the queen brought him with her. Richard the Third joined his queen at Warwick Castle, where they kept court with great magnificence for a week. It must have been at this visit that the portraits of Queen Anne, of Richard the Third, and their son, were added to the Rue Roll. The popular opinion concerning Richard's deformity is verified by the portrait, for his figure, if not crooked, is decidedly hunchy. Nor must this appearance be attributed to the artist's lack of skill in delineating the human form, for the neighboring portraits, by the same hand, representing Anne's father, the great Earl of Warwick, is as finely proportioned as if meant for a model of St. George. Richard, on the contrary, has high thick shoulders and no neck. Surely, if the king's ungainly figure had not been matter of great notoriety, an artist capable of making such a noble sketch as that of the earl would not have brought the king's ears and shoulders in quite such close contact. Warwick was dead, Richard was alive, when these series of portraits closes. Therefore, if any pictorial flattery exists, in all probability Richard had the advantage of it. Among other contemporary descriptions of Richard, not generally known, is the following metrical portrait, though author seems inclined to apologize for drawing him as he really was. The king's own brother, he, I mean, who was deformed by nature, crook-backed and ill-conditioned, worse-faced and ugly creature, yet a great peer for princes, peers, are not always beauteous. From Warwick Castle, Queen Anne and King Richard went to Coventry, where was dated August 15, 1483, a memorandum of an account of 180 pounds owed to Richard Gowles, Mercer, London, for goods delivered for the use of Queen Anne, as specified in bills in the care of John Kendall, the King's secretary. The court arrived at York, August 31st. The re-coronation of the king and queen, likewise the reinvestiture of Prince Edward of Gloucester as Prince of Wales, took place soon after, at this city. Measures which must have originated in the fact that the sons of Edward IV had been put to death during the northern progress of the court, the usurper considered that oaths of allegiance taken at the re-coronation would be more legal than when the right heirs were alive. The overflowing paternity of Richard, which, perhaps, urged him to commit some of his crimes, thus speaks in his patents for creating his son Prince of Wales, whose singular wit and endowments of nature wherewith, his young age considered, he is remarkably furnished, do portend, by the favor of God, that he will make an honest man. But small chance was there for such a miracle if his life had been spared. It is curious that Richard the Third should express hopes for his son's future honesty at the very moment when he was putting him in possession of his murdered cousin's property. After the coronation had been performed in York Cathedral, Queen Anne walked in grand procession through the streets of the city, holding her little son by the right hand. He wore the demi-crown appointed for the heir of England. The Middleham Household Book mentions that five marks were paid to Mitchell Wharton, for bringing the prince's jewels from York on this occasion. The same document proves that the court were at Pontefract, September 15th. That fearful fortress recently stained with the blood of Richard's victims. Richard gave, by the way, in charity to a poor woman, three shillings six pence. The charge of baiting the royal charret was two pence. And the expenses of the removal of my lord prince's household to Pontefract, twenty-four shillings. 
a formidable insurrection headed by the duke of buckingham recalled richard to the metropolis he left his son for security among his northern friends but queen anne accompanied her husband it is a doubtful point whether anne approved of the crimes which thus advanced her son tradition declares she abhorred them but parliamentary documents prove she shared with james tyrrell the plunder of richard's opponents after the rebellion of buckingham was crushed she received one hundred marks the king seven hundred marks and sir james tyrrell two manors from sir william nivet being the purchase money for his life anne's share of this plunder amounts to considerably more than her portion of queen's gold if anne had even passively consented to the unrighteous advancement of her family punishment quickly followed for her son on the last day of march fourteen eighty four died at middleham castle an unhappy death this expression used by rue his family chronicler leads his readers to imagine that this boy so deeply idolized by his guilty father came by his end in some sudden and awful manner his parents were not with him but were as near as nottingham castle when he expired the loss of this child in whom all anne's hopes and happiness were garnered struck to her heart and she never again knew a moment's health or comfort she seemed even to court death eagerly nor was this dreadful loss her only calamity richard had no other child his declining and miserable consort was not likely to bring another and if he did not consider her in the way his guilty and ruffian satellites certainly did for they began to whisper dark things concerning the illegality of the king's marriage and the possibility of it being set aside as edward the fourth's parliament considered that it was possible for anne to divorce richard in fourteen seventy four it cannot be doubted that richard could have resorted to the same manner of getting rid of her when queen her evident decline however prevented richard from giving himself any trouble regarding a divorce yet it did not restrain him from uttering peevish complaints to rotherham archbishop of york regarding his wife's sickliness and disagreeable qualities rotheringham who had just been released from as much coercion as a king of england dared offer a spiritual peer who had not appeared in open insurrection ventured to prophesy from these expressions that richard's queen would suddenly depart from this world this speech got circulated in the guard chamber and gave rise to a report that the queen whose personal sufferings and a protracted decline had caused her to keep her chamber for some days was actually dead anne was sitting at her toilet with her tresses unbound when this strange rumor was communicated to her she considered it was the forerunner of her death by violent means and in a great agony ran to her husband with her hair disheveled as it was and streaming eyes and piteous sobs asked him what she had done to deserve death richard it is expressly said soothed her with fair words and smiles bidding her be of good cheer for in sooth she had no other cause the next report which harassed the declining and dying queen was that her husband was impatient for her demise that he might give his hand to his niece the princess elizabeth of york this rumor had no influence on the conduct of anne since the continuator of the croyland chronicle mentions the queen's kindness to her husband's niece in these words the lady elizabeth who had been some months out of sanctuary was sent by her mother to attend the queen at court at the christmas festivals kept with great state in westminster hall elizabeth and her four sisters were received with all honourable courtesy by queen anne especially the lady elizabeth was ranked most familiarly in the queen's favour who treated her as a sister but neither society that she loved nor all the pomp and festivity of royalty could cure the languor or heal the wound in the queen's breast for the loss of her son the young earl of warwick was after the death of richard's son proclaimed heir to the english throne and as such took his seat at the royal table during the lifetime of his aunt queen anne as these honors were withdrawn from the ill-fated boy directly after the death of the queen it is reasonable to infer that he owed them to some influence she possessed with her husband since young warwick as her sister's son was her heir as well as his within the year that deprived anne of her only son maternal sorrow put an end to her existence 
by a decline slow enough to acquit her husband of poisoning her, a crime of which he is accused by most writers. She died at Westminster Palace on March 16, 1485, in the midst of the greatest eclipse of the sun that had happened for many years. Her funeral was most pompous and magnificent. Her husband was present and was observed to shed tears, deemed hypocritical by the bystander, but those who knew that he had been brought up with Anne might suppose that he felt some instinctive yearnings of long companionship when he saw her laid in that grave where his ambitious interests had caused him to wish her to be. Human nature, with all its conflicting passions and instincts, abounds with such inconsistencies, which are often startlingly apparent in the hardest characters. The queen was interred near the altar at Westminster, not far from the monument of Anne of Cleves. No memorial marks the spot where the broken heart of the hapless Anne of Warwick found rest, from as much sorrow as could possibly be crowded into the brief span of thirty-one years. End of section 21. End of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 3, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland.